consider buying a Stars and Stripes Freedom Deck to support my educational series, available from La Lotaria Loca. Download and archive these chapters, or rip them off the site you are viewing them on, and save them while you can, just in case this current channel gets shut down for covering any of these topics. Before we begin, keep in mind the vocabulary and vernacular written in this book was common practice from a different time in our history. If you are sensitive to the use of such language, you will completely miss the message and the hard work that Manning Johnson sacrificed for the improvement and safety of our country. Our nation has been manipulated by utilizing division in our communities by Marxist ideology. As early as 1928, the communists declared that the racial differences among our people constituted the weakest and most vulnerable point in our social fabric. By constantly probing and straining at this one spot, they calculated that eventually the cloth could be torn apart and that Americans could be divided, weakened, and perhaps even set against each other in open combat. We mustn't kid ourselves into thinking that the communists have placed their agitators only into the black communities. They're working both sides of the street. They want hatred, violence, and bloodshed between the races, and they don't care how they get it or whom they use, even children if necessary. Here is a book that I think ought to be in every home library. It's entitled Color, Communism, and Common Sense by Manning Johnson. He joined the party as a young man because he honestly believed that the communists were trying to improve the conditions of his people. He was a dedicated communist, and eventually he rose to one of the highest ranks. But after many years, he discovered that instead they were merely planning to use his people in a bloody revolution to destroy America. And when he woke up to this, he dropped out of the party and devoted the rest of his life trying to alert his fellow citizens of all races to the true nature of the Communist Party as he knew it to be from the inside. In modern literature, anti-communists are generally pictured as scoundrels. On the other hand, Left-wing perjurers and jailbirds are shown as persecuted lambs, but there is a special vitriol uncorked for those who have followed communism and have repented to such an extent that they are publicly willing to stand up and testify against it by word and deed. The writer of this pamphlet, Manning Johnson, is an example of such treatment. The Supreme Court of the United States used a communist statement in a decision of the majority opinion, as delivered by Justice Felix Frankenfurter to brand Manning Johnson as giving tainted testimony and cited as a basis for this statement to the Communist Party brief. The left-wing papers, including the New York Herald Tribune, joyfully took up the cry. Of course, careful investigation shows that Manning Johnson is not a perjurer, and it would be easy to prove this in any court not dominated by such a character as Felix Frankenfurter. Manning Johnson's story begins very much like other Negroes brought up in a religious home. He was inducted into the party largely because of the preachings of a communist bishop retired of the Episcopal Church, William Montgomery Brown. Manning Johnson is a man of ability and education and felt himself frustrated by his race and color and fell under the spell of the communist propaganda. The communists, however, reckoned without understanding that the man they had enlisted in their cause had, for them, certain dangerous qualities. He had a Christian upbringing he was intelligent, and he had courage. His Christian upbringing made him revolt at the obscene immorality of the Communist Party and its members. His intelligence made him see through the stupidity of the Communist doctrine and see that he should strive to be a first-class Negro instead of an imitation of a third-class white man. His courage made him willing to confess his sins in public and try to expiate them. It is for this last quality that the Frankenfurter Supreme Court and the left-wing press can never forgive him. I hope you will read Manning Johnson's pamphlet carefully. If you do, you will understand how the communists have used and are using certain American Negroes to the detriment of all Americans, white or black. You will read the story of one Negro who has gone through the fire and come out tempered steel. July 22, 1958. Archibald B. Roosevelt, President of the Alliance, Inc. Chapter 1. In the Web. Ten years I labored in the cause of communism. I was a dedicated comrade. All my talents and efforts were zealously used to bring about the triumph of communism in America and throughout the world. 
To me, the end of capitalism would mark the beginning of an indeterminable period of plenty, peace, prosperity, and universal comradeship. All racial and class differences and conflicts would end forever after the liquidation of the capitalists, their government, and their supporters. A world union of Soviet states under the hegemony of Russia would free and lead mankind onto utopia. Being an idealist, I was sold this bill of goods by a Negro graduate of the Lenin Institute in Moscow. The color of one's skin is no bar to a young man or woman dreaming of making a better world. Like other Negroes, I experienced and saw many injustices and inequities around me based upon color, not ability. I was told that the decadent capitalist system is responsible, that mass pressure could force concessions, but that just prolongs the life of capitalism, that I must unite and work with all those who more or less agree that capitalism must go. Little did I realize, until I was deeply enmeshed in the Red Conspiracy, that just and seeming grievances are exploited to transform idealism into a cold and ruthless weapon against the capitalist system, that this is an end toward which all the communists' efforts among Negroes are directed. Indeed, I had entered the Red Conspiracy in the vain belief that it was the way to a new, better, and superior world system of society. Ten years later, thoroughly disillusioned, I abandoned communism. The experiences of those years in outer darkness are like a horrible nightmare. I saw communism in all its naked cruelty, ruthlessness, and utter contempt for Christian attributes and passions. And too, I saw the low value placed upon human life, the total lack of respect for the dignity of man, the betrayal of trust, the terror of the secret police, and the bloody hand of the assassin during and since those fateful years when I embraced communism. I was lured into the Red Movement, by way of the American Negro Labor Congress, one of many front organizations set up by the communists to trap the naive, unwary, unsuspecting, and idealistic Negro. The use of such attractive and appealing fronts as a means of entrapment is a most important serpentine method of the Reds. After two years of practical training in organizing street demonstrations, inciting mob violence, how to fight the police, and how to politically throw a brick and hide, I was ready, in the opinion of my leaders, for a top communist school. At a secret national training school in New York City, I was given an extensive and intensive course in the theory and practice of red political warfare. As a result, I was appointed district organizer by the Political Bureau of the Communist Party in the Buffalo, New York area, one of the vital industrial sections of our country. It was in the position of district organizer that I learned to use secret codes, mail drops, organize clandestine meetings, shake police shadows, and other underground activities. At the same time, I became acquainted with the nature of communist sabotage and espionage. My zeal, training, both theoretical and practical, combined with loyalty and willingness to sacrifice, changed me from a novice into a dedicated red, a professional revolutionist. Consequently, I climbed rapidly to the National Committee the highest governing body of the Communist Party in America. Being a Negro top communist, I was placed on the National Negro Commission, an important subcommittee of the National Committee of the Communist Party. On this commission, which was created on direct orders from Moscow to facilitate the subversion of the Negroes, I began to realize the full implication of how the Negro is used as a political dupe by the Kremlin hierarchy, under the guise of unity of black and white in the struggle. Several top white communists, such as James S. Allen, Elizabeth Lawson, the late Robert Bob Miner, and George Blake Charney were placed on the National Negro Commission. These white communists wielded more power than the nominal Negro heads of the commission. In a word, they were like white overseers. Every Negro member was aware of the fact that these white overseers constituted the eyes, the ears, and the voice of the Kremlin. Moreover, these white overseers are the surest functional guarantee of the maintenance of the hierarchical authoritarian control of the Kremlin over their Negro lick spittles, directing the conspiracy among Negroes in America. Indeed, it is the white group on the National Negro Commission that holds full sway. They flatter one or two top Negroes by making them feel they are actually participating in the formulation of policy by consulting with them prior to meetings of the commission. Then these two Negroes are assigned to lay down the line to the other Negroes on the commission. The white members check to make sure that they do. Their opinion of what a Negro member says at a meeting can either make or break him. 
Usually, the Negro who is broken is accused of petty bourgeois nationalism, that is placing the interests of the Negro above the interests of the Communist Party. In this connection, I observed how the white women communists are used as political prostitutes, cohabiting with high-level Negro communists in order to spy on them. Through such intimate relations, these white women communists are able to elicit information pertaining to family background, sources of income, marital difficulties, arrests, convictions, opinions on the communist policy and communist leadership. This information is invaluable to the red hierarchy in their relations with their Negro lickspittles. In the top red circles, this is known as bedroom politics. White communist women are also used to maneuver top Negro reds into compromising positions that, if revealed, would result in public scandal or disgrace. In this way, the Reds make these Negroes permanently subject to blackmail if they ever consider leaving the Red movement. Moreover, this information is used to destroy the credibility of the defectee should he decide to fight the Red conspiracy. The highest position I attained was candidate for the political bureau, or politburo, of the Communist Party. The Politburo is a small, close-knit body carefully selected by the Kremlin hierarchy. Each member holds his position solely on the approval of the reactionary, rapacious despoilers in the Kremlin. This is the real governing body of the entire Red Conspiracy in America. A candidate is invited to sit on the deliberations with voice but no vote. Usually, a representative of the Kremlin participates in all meetings and deliberations of the Politburo. This writer sat in such meetings when Gerard Heisler, alias Edwards, Brown, Hansberger, etc., was the Kremlin representative. Eisler later jumped bail and fled the United States on the Red Poish liner, Batori, after he was exposed and convicted of passport fraud. The assignment of political commissaries to the Red movement in America is not limited solely to America, but is an established Kremlin policy in relation to all communist parties in countries outside of the Iron Curtain. Kremlin agents, such as Eisler, exercise an awesome power over the white as well as black lickspittles comprising the leadership. When Eisler spoke, one could hear a pinfall. Each leader sat in rapt attention, hanging on to every word Eisler uttered as if it were indeed a pronouncement from the Holy of Holies. On several occasions, he expressed the grave dissatisfaction of the Kremlin because of the failure of the party to take advantage of the broad People's Front movement, to build progressive groups in participating organizations such as the NAACP, youth, religious, fraternal, labor, etc. These progressive groups, he said, was the only guarantee that the decisions we make with leaders will be brought down to and carried out by the membership. Significantly, Eisler emphasized that the People's Front, or Democratic Front, is a maneuver only to lay the basis for firm communist direction and control of masses, and too that the leaders of the non-communist organizations are drawn into joint movements with the communists only to facilitate the infiltration, ideological, and organizational penetration of their respective organizations. After all, this is a fight for leadership to determine who shall lead the masses, the communists, are Negro reformists. The progressive groups, consisting of communists, fellow travelers, sympathizers, liberals, etc., constitute the vehicle on which the Reds pin their present hope of victory. Never once were we allowed to forget the vacillating, uncertain, untrustworthy character of the Negro intellectual, the Negro minister, the Negro petty bourgeois, the Negro reformist, and the white socio-liberal philanthropic humanitarian supporter. They are accused on the basis of experience of running frantically from one camp, red, to the other, capitalist, when the going gets tough. So that when communists unite with and support them today, it is necessary to keep in mind that it may be necessary to denounce them tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow hang them. Thus, as a participant on the highest level of the communist conspiracy in America, I observed the cold, calculating, ruthless nature of red power politics and political warfare, stripped of all its illusory propaganda and idealistic cover. Johnson specifically wrote, Being an idealist, I was sold this bill of goods by a Negro graduate of the Lenin Institute in Moscow. The ideological subversion has been introduced slowly throughout the decades. It started in the universities and has slowly made its way into public schools, even as early as elementary. Racial division is taught to prepubescent children. Welcome to Radical Cram School. We're going to learn about social justice, revolution, and how to be powerful in the bodies that you have. Hello, 
my young comrades. Hi. I'm going to show a picture. This is my way of figuring out if you've been tainted by the patriarchy. Patriarchy? What? Oh, oh, oh I that. Who do you think it is? This looks creepy. <laughs> it looks creepy. <laughs> Why? There's just like this thing about white people that just makes me be like, <laughs> like, I'm like, and they're like right there in a pool, and I'm just like walking into the pool, and they just give me the death stare, and then I'm just like. So if this guy was in the pool, <laughs> you would moonwalk out. Yeah, Does he look like a good stop. guy or a bad guy? Bad guy. Bad guy. Who, who do we think this is? Make a guess. Oh, Dumbledore. Dumbledore. Who is he married to? <laughs> Who's your guess? Katy Perry. <laughs> Donald Trump! Uh, uh, it's Donald Duck. What do we know about him? What do we know about him? He's bad. I want to fire him! I want to build a wall! How do we feel about this wall? It is bl blocking opportunity for people that don't live in America to come here for a better opportunity. And, and uh, we all came at some point from some other place. My dad came here and my mom came here too. They came here from where? Cambodia. Oh, wow. What do you think they think that they came from all the way to Cambodia and this is what they get to look at on the TV screen all the time? <laughs> Kitty, what is she missing? Where's, where's her mouth? No, her mouth? Why doesn't she have a mouth? The people who created her didn't want Asian girls um, to, to speak up about their, who they yeah. are. Yeah, to speak up about who they are. In this video, you see the instructor uses images of people who have been proven to be abhorrent or who are regarded as being disgusting people by certain societal standards, which is easy to do with any given race, as each race has its examples of noble or degenerate people. But the point of this indoctrination exercise is to specifically draw focus of disdain towards white people by using a few individuals to represent the whole race. Just and seeming grievances are exploited to transform idealism into a cold and ruthless weapon, Johnson wrote. And throughout the book, he cites and explains how conflict is coordinated by communists through a stealth method of racial instigation between the black and white communities. Its publication is emphasized through the media, with headlines of incitement that occur whether it is a successful instigation or a natural occurrence. Even today, legacy media and social media platforms repeat the process, slowly tearing at the fabric of American society. Colin Kaepernick, after taking a knee for the national anthem, was the center of media and social attention because he claimed he knelt to highlight the problem of police brutality. Colin took the stage of a supposed oppressed class and changed his professional spotlight from an athlete to an activist. He no longer has any incentive to be an athlete, as he is more financially successful from being an activist, which is why he continues to rinse and repeat social activism publicity stunts. Jesse Smollett faked a hate crime, and still never to this day admitted it was a hoax, despite the amount of evidence proving he orchestrated it himself. His ego was more important to him than the racial division he was inciting for clout, along with the desired pay raise to his casting in the show, Empire and to politically advance the narrative of the Democratic Party's rhetoric and propaganda against Donald Trump and his supporters. Trevor Noah, a comedian originally from South Africa, has become a public figure through his affirmative action casting as a replacement host of The Daily Show. After being gift-wrapped this spot on network television, he has used his prominence as an extended mouthpiece of left-wing rhetoric in America. What they all have in common, whether it is of personal party connection or if they are just useful idiots, is that they adopt propaganda that is politically advantageous to the Democratic Party, purposely framing events in negative or positive contexts according to the electoral benefit of their party. This is just three people, and I would list more, as the list is endless and growing exponentially. However, for the sake of time, I will have to dedicate that to a separate series in the future and in much more detail. Manning Johnson states he was lured into the communist trap by way of the American Negro Labor Congress, a front organization used to attract members of the black community. During my generation, the front organization for Marxist ideology is the notorious Black Lives Matter. During a workshop in 2010 at an event called the U.S. Social Forum, Patrice Cullors compares a book written by Eric Mann called The Seven Components of Transformative Organizing Theory to Mao Zedong's Little Red Book. Mao is historically remembered as Chairman Mao, the Chinese Communist Revolutionary 
who ruled as the chairman of the Communist Party from its establishment in 1949 until his death in 1976. He killed more people than both Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, many of those deaths resulting from a policy called the Great Leap Forward, which killed 45 million people in four years, making it the biggest event of mass murder ever recorded. My question to this audience, what I really would like to hear is what are you, like, one, get the book, like, just point blank, period. <laughs> I like saying that. Um, get the book at three to five dollars. But then what are you willing to do with it? I would like to hear people like some creative solutions. I was at the art publications table today, and I was speaking to this uh, young person from Arizona who's trying to fight uh, SB 1070. And I was, he, he, he grabbed a book and he said, it's like Mal's Red Book. And I was like, man, that's what I was thinking. And it was just really cool to hear him make that connection. I was like, how about you buy like 10 to 15 of these books and you all have like a youth like organizing group where you talk about it and you really try to engage this. And we can just kind of, we need to build off of this. And so that leads me to um, my, a point that I, I actually wanted to kind of focus on today which is, um, I think I have a, a really important role in speaking to youth. I, I have, maybe it's because I came in the movement at 17 and a half, so I have like just a knack for knowing how to organize young people into this organization and kind of teach them this, this politic and then hear them now organize other people. But I think what I wanna um, talk about is the role of quote, youth organizing. During this workshop, Patrice is so enthusiastic about the comparison and connection of Eric Mann's book to Mao's Little Red Book, which was responsible for killing tens of millions of people. Part of my conversation with this group of people today, with 300 of you, which I hope you'll go back to your own cities and your own neighborhoods and your own communities and bring this piece of work back, not as just um, a, a pamphlet, but as an organizing tool, as an organizing model. and. I think for me, when I came to the organization, when I was organized into the organization, I was 17 and a half, um, I was really angry. I was really angry. And I didn't have uh, a direction. I just was spewing anger. Eric Mann is a prime example of the type of person who Manning Johnson warned about, a person who will take advantage of the anger, frustration, and rejection that can be perceived in a minority group. These recognizable emotions make the Marxist ideology more palatable, especially within the youth population as they are easier to indoctrinate. As Patrice stated how she was brought into the organization at the age of 17, and her anger was a part of the process that brought her in. So then when I met the black movement, I said, oh, I thought Jews were assertive. Wait till I saw, this is the ultimate assertion, the ultimate anger, and what I didn't get before was a revolutionary theory mm -hmm. of change. Mm -hmm. So when I joined the movement, it was all about, do you know about Africa? No, and then we're part of the Indians. What are the Indians? Oh yeah, and this country is wrong. This country is fundamentally wrong. It's built on the wrong foundations, built on genocide. So I didn't come up with the word. Mm -hmm. I said, wait, genocide, just like what happened Oh, I remember genocide, that's what my parents taught me about. So quickly I got it, Jews, blacks, Native Americans, the world, people starving. Eric Mann was also a member of an organization called the Students for a Democratic Society and was an active leader of a faction called the Weathermen. This faction later became a militant left-wing organization called Weather Underground. This organization is well known for one of its members named Susan Rosenberg, who came to fame after she bombed the U.S. Capitol in 1983. She was sentenced to 58 years in prison, but only served 16 of them when her sentence was commuted by President Bill Clinton on January 20, 2001, which was his last day in office. Returning to Patrice Colors, she even states how she is a trained Marxist in an interview with a network called The Real News. I think of a lot of things. The first thing I think is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Um, we are uh, super uh, versed um, on sort of ideological theories. And I think that what we really try to do is build a movement that could be utilized by many, many black folk. The ideological foundation 
is Marxism. The trained Marxist. That's exactly what she she just made it. She just said it. That wasn't a secret. That I mean, I, I've long known that. But for those of you that have been on the fence with this, you heard it from the horse's mouth. So this is why it's not actually even a co-op. So even sometimes I misspeak and I kind of su suggest that. I don't necessarily just say that. I kind of allude to it. Let's say that. But it's not necessarily a co-op when we talk about these like white leftist communists and so forth. It's not a co-op. That's what they believe in. So all of you crackheads that have been centering your last two weeks of your life around donating to this organization, you need to understand what you've been funding. You have been funding Marxism. Okay? That's not a, no, it's not a secret. As so many of you guys, including people in my, in my genre, metalcore, hardcore, because everybody's virtue signaling. So they would sell merch, half of the proceeds, if not all of the proceeds, going to where? Black Lives Matter. You are funding Marxists, okay? So some of you guys are proud of that, whatever. But a lot of you guys would deny that that's the case because they, you know, we when people call that communism or we call that Marxism, people think that it's just like, we, you're just saying it, right? Everybody's a communist. It's like McCarthyism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, speaking of McCarthyism. But... Anybody that could pick up how they navigate would have been long able to sniff this out. You've been funding Marxists. Admitted trained Marxists. She just told you, bro. Admitted trained Marxists. And I think this is a failure of education. This is why the state should monopolize. Because Marxism is an ideolo ideology excuse me, that has killed millions upon millions of people. Now, we look at Nazism and we see that as an objectively bad thing, as we should. Because it is objectively bad. It is not a good thing. But you look at Stalin, Zedong, or Mao, and Pol Pot, and spots of pockets of Africa all over the world. This, ideolog this ideology has a body count that far surpasses Nazism. Now, I would say they're close together. Now, that's another thing. Schools. They, treat, they teach you like as if Nazism and communism are on two completely different sides of the political spectrum, which is silly when you consider that for, for a long period of time, socialism and communism were basically interchangeable terms. And then you look at godfathers of fascist, fascism, like Mussolini, who was a Marxist. Nonetheless, that's the only difference is really just international. One's international socialism, one's more of a national form of socialism. That's it. That's really the, the difference. However, communism, proud communism, proud communist, Marxist, have a body count that is unlike anybody else in recent history. And you have people that are, are parading around as if this is a good ideology to adopt. Uh, to adopt. This anti-property rights, anti-voluntary exchange, anti-self-ownership, and certainly anti-non-aggression. I think a lot of people, and this is sort of how leftists, like more mainstream leftists, like Democrats, who maybe not be Marxists per se, but they foster this culture, right? They foster this, uh, these sorts of people because they've used, they've been useful idiots for them. I think now we're seeing a point with, with, with some of the things that are breaking out around the country. You're seeing that the people that are like the, <laughs> they're running the asylum now in, in a sense, but that's partially because, you know, Democrats and mainstream leftists have fostered this. They've coddled these guys. They've protected these types said that they weren't what they were. Oh, you're just over, you're just being over dramatic. Why would you say that? Like, you think that it's just some some coincidence that groups like, um, or people that are proudly, which is another kind of less organized group, you know, when you look at what you guys consider Antifa, it's not a, it's not a secret as to why they latch their wagon onto like Black Lives Matter, because they both with the black and red. So a lot of you who have been signaling your pants off have been donating money to Marxists. Now, a lot of you guys are okay with that. That's fine. Not, it's not fine, but, you know, whatever. Some of you guys are proud. That's not necessarily who I'm who I'm actually talking about. I'm talking to one of some of you other guys who have been very dishonest, um, even going as far as to claim people are lying when they say that this movement is attached to Marxism. That's exactly what it's attached to. So you can sit up here and be mad, be upset. I gave it to you right from the horse's mouth. And like I said, that's not news. It's just got to update your resume, if you will. Show y'all that this is what it is. So don't sit up here and let, try to be lecturing people um, about this. This is just what it is. And a lot of you guys have been funny. Some of you guys are proud. Some of you got egg on your face. I don't care either way. Marxist is a deadly um, ideology. It should be shunned. It should be shamed. And I absolutely will continue to do so. Johnson also states in the book of his training in organizing street demonstrations, inciting mob violence, how to fight the police, and how to politically throw a brick and hide. Welcome back to Five Live. This is a live look from KMGH, a helicopter shot in Denver, Colorado, where you can see a bunch of demonstrators laying down their 
protesting in support of the Black Lives Matter movement in memory of George Floyd. Uh, wow, that's seems a like this we've seen shot. Truly. across the country. Really, really incredible. Yeah. Furthermore, he received extensive and intensive training in the course of red political warfare in a New York City school. Even today, in my generation, the tactics of communism remain the same. However, during the Johnson era, Russia was the influencing force. Today, in my era, aside from the communist seeds that have been historically planted throughout America's society, the Chinese Communist Party has taken the helm of ideological infiltration and subversion. The practice of using women as political prostitutes echoes throughout history. During Johnson's era, I have come to the conclusion that this may be the birthplace of the exploitation for desire, fetishization, and attraction to white women planted into the minds of black men. And before you get caught up in a woke and condescending knot, allow me to explain. There is nothing wrong with interracial relationships. However, it is foolish to ignore the influence of bedroom politics. Women are historically desired by the biological sexual thirst of men. And to think that it is not possible to weaponize that desire is ignorant at best. As the tactics are parallel throughout the history of communism, Russians used white women as political prostitutes to further the advances of their cause, as China has used women in today's efforts of the same communist objective. It is a story straight out of a spy novel, alleging steaminess and skullduggery. But the biggest fish she targeted, according to Axios, California Congressman Eric Swalwell, a Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee. Prostitution has also evolved from a political weapon of blackmail into the enhancement of social status, from the Me Too movement to advantageous opportunities, as Dr. Umar Johnson had the unfortunate circumstance of experiencing. I heard an NFL player wanted to give you a million dollars. And I lost it because... Because of the conscious crime. Okay, I met a sister. Online? No. It wasn't online? No, no. Why do you say you I don't meet women DMs, on... No! <laughs> I was the keynote speaker at the okay. Marcus Garvey Celebration of Fort Lauderdale, Florida last year. Okay. August the 17th, 2014. She came to the event with her son. Okay, I took a picture with him. She texted me the picture. She said, by the way, I'm from Philadelphia. No problem, sis. When you come on up, let's hang out. She was dressed cultural, hair wrapped up, dashiki dress, aunt. Conscious sister. We link up. Two months later, I'm over in Birmingham, England, keynoting African Liberation Day in England, and my phone started blowing up. She's all over the internet. Dr. Umar Johnson dated me. I'm a stripper. Da -da 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 -da. You didn't tell me that. I'm supposed to know you're a stripper. I've never been to a strip club in my life. So this was a case of a woman, okay? She basically tried to pull a superhead on me. I am mm. going to destroy this man. Despite what he's trying to do to save our children, I'm going to destroy him to try to make myself famous. Before that campaign to try to destroy my credibility, nobody knew her. Now she has tens of thousands of followers. It hurts because why would you do that to somebody working like me? Mm -hmm. Okay? Telling people I'm not serious about my school. This is all a joke. I saw you three times, sister. We were together three times, Charlotte. I mean, how do you get all this information from a man you saw three times within a period of nine days? Did you have sex with her? We have relations. Okay. But... That don't justify this, and it definitely doesn't justify you attacking my school. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to slander me, slander me. Sometimes people do that when they don't get what they want out of a relationship. But to attack this man's program to save our kids, something you know nothing about, something he never discussed with you, that was wrong. Sounds like right. you said, I love you too, Amir. And the NFL. Woman, man. You said, I she could have just bed. said you were bad in bed or that something. She didn't right. have to but say. she attacked the school. That's, right. That's what hurt me. Don't mess with that. That is my life work. That's my pride in when it come to saving black children, black boys don't mess with that. And but you think it's because, like, you know, 
you you speak the way that you speak, and it's almost it's not a holier than thou thing. I don't think that you're doing that, but people may have that. Perception. I never claimed to be a preacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. people. But have no, that I perception. respect black women. Yeah. But the two of us made a conscious decision as adults, Charlemagne. Why does that become the uh, conversation in the community? Why does that personal uh, situation get put out there and then exploited? Okay, lies filled. To, why did you have to do that? Why didn't you just have a conversation with me? Gotcha. We never had an argument, a fallout. All I know is I woke up one day and this is what it was. And certain websites that had never posted anything on Dr. Umar Johnson, all of a sudden this was a, a was story. T- and I refused to do an interview, Angie. You know why? Interview me about the war against black boys. Interview me about mass incarceration. Interview me about what I'm doing with the fundraiser. Interview me about how many thousands of kids I kept out of jail, kept out of special ed, got out of special ed, kept off drugs. Interview me about something positive. Interview me about Frederick Dulles, Marcus Garvey. Don't interview me about some garbage. But our people love sensationalized negativity. China had struggle sessions, the Cultural Revolution, and the Red Guard. Russia had Bolsheviks and the Proletarian Revolution. Even historically in America, we had the Salem Witch Hunt. The final and important note to take from this chapter is the parallel tactics of today's cancel culture. Johnson states the communist behavior of supporting an ally today, but to keep in mind, it may be necessary to denounce them tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, hang them. It is exactly the same in my generation's left-wing, liberal, woke, and socialist circles of society. J.K. Rowling not necessarily hurt financially by cancel culture, as she owns the rights to her intellectual property. However, she was accused of being transphobic for having made public statements that sex is in fact biological. Not only was she rejected by a large portion of her fandom, but also by the actors whose careers were created by her intellectual property. James Damore was fired from his job at Google after attending a mandatory unconscious bias training program and writing a documented response about it on a private server, which Google encourages its employees to do. The document was only available on this private server in the company. It was never made public until someone within Google had leaked it. Once it was public, it was misrepresented as a sexist and misogynistic manifesto. Manifesto also being a word that is misused in legacy media for political purposes. What does that mean? As I was reading the manifesto, I couldn't help but wonder, how would these words sound coming out of the mouths of women? Differences, differences, differences in distribution of traits between men and women may in part explain why we don't have 50% 50% representation of women in tech and leadership. Discrimination to reach equal representation is unfair, divisive, and bad for business. What? I'm simply stating that the distribution of preferences and abilities of men and women differ in part due to biological causes. And that these differences may explain why we don't see equal equal representation equal representation of women in tech in tech and leadership. This guy's an ass. <laughs> women on average have more. Oh God. Neuroticism, higher anxiety, lower stress tolerance. This may contribute to the higher levels of anxiety women report on Google Geist and to the lower number of women in high stress jobs. This is bull. This is. What is this guy talking about? We need to stop. We need to stop. We need to stop assuming that gender gaps imply sexism. Because women on average show higher interest in people. And men in things? Men care more about things than women do? James Damore made many public appearances to expand on what his actual document was about versus the viral narratives that misrepresented him. Sundar said that it wasn't because you criticized Google's trainings or you questioned the role of ideology in the workplace. Uh, He said those were actually important topics. You know, what he said was uh, what you said was advancing harmful gender stereotypes, and that was against Google's code of conduct. So it would make people, you know, feel discriminated against. I'm not saying anything about the women at Google, which is what he was implying, that I was saying that the women at Google have different traits. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that People that go into tech are interested in things versus people generally. And as a population, there are fewer women that are interested in things versus people. And we need to be cognizant of that if we're trying to improve how many people want to get into tech. Dr. Deborah So, a Canadian science columnist, author, political commentator, and former academic sex researcher who wrote the book The End of Gender, was interviewed by Lou Perez, a comedian and host of the YouTube channel, about James Damore's situation. When James Damore's Google Manifesto came out, I found out something interesting that I had in common with his critics. I didn't read the memo either. It's like 10 pages. Come on, who has time for that? 
it's much easier just to be outraged about it. Now, I'm here with Dr. Deborah So, a science journalist and columnist for Playboy and Globe and Mail. Dr. So, who's more likely to be outraged by something they didn't even bother to read? Is that a girl thing or a guy thing? Um... So you were someone who came to Demore's defense. You wrote uh, an article titled, No, the Google Manifesto isn't sexist or anti-diversity, it's science. Since his critics are probably not going to read it, uh, let's go through the title. It's Google's ideological echo chamber, how bias clouds are thinking about diversity and inclusion. I mean, I almost didn't get through the title, it's so long. Like, could you, could you just summarize uh, the argument? So I can't speak for James. My understanding is that he was trying to help Google and try to understand why their diversity initiatives weren't working. They had been trying to recruit more women, but they still weren't able to have a 50-50 ratio. Um, and so he looked at some of the scientific research and was saying, well, you know, maybe it's not a problem with these diversity efforts. Maybe it's just that women don't inherently find STEM disciplines as interesting. And so if that's the case, maybe there isn't actually a problem here. It doesn't make sense to try and find a solution if there isn't a problem. I wonder if there's any uh, chance that like women just don't want to work with James Damore. He seems lovely, so I wouldn't say that. Okay, all right. Somebody's jealous. Okay. All right. James Damore, he brought up testosterone and its effect on our development and our attraction towards certain activities or jobs. Uh, can you go into that a little bit? Yes, there's a very large and long-standing body of research literature that supports the fact that prenatal testosterone exposure predicts what we will find interesting, what we gravitate towards uh, when we're born and in adulthood. So higher levels of exposure are associated with more male typical interests and activities, so mechanically interesting activities, um, whereas lower levels of exposure are associated with socially engaging activities. So this is why men are usually exposed to higher levels of testosterone. That's why they gravitate towards um, you know, mechanically interesting occupations like STEM disciplines, whereas women tend to, uh, they're exposed to lower levels, so they gravitate towards more socially engaging occupations. Lindsay Shepard was a student who was also a teaching assistant at the Wilfrid Laurier University. She was subject to an unwarranted inquisition after showing a video of Jordan Peterson debating Nicholas Matt about Bill C-16 in a language skill class regarding gender pronouns. More recently, Gina Carano was fired by Disney from The Mandalorian Show after making a statement on social media about how violence begins with hatred. It was misrepresented through legacy media in some cases, outlets tied to Disney that she was making an anti-Semitic statement, and left-wing activists through social media misrepresented her post as comparing the American conservatives to the Jews of World War II. But her post was a statement about how if you demonize a group of people long enough, violence against them would soon be justified. Sarah Silverman, who has a history of supporting cancel culture, and has even faced public scrutiny for jokes she made in the past, has changed her perspective after people in her personal circle had been subject to the mob of cancel culture. Christian Picciolini, my friend, who was a neo-Nazi for years, since he was from 14 to, you know, into his 20s, late 20s maybe, was the head of a, a neo-Nazi, whatever KKK chapter where he lived. He has spent the last 30 years getting people out of hate groups. That's what he does. But he went towards love. He was 14, he was smoking a joint, and an older kid took the joint out of his hand and threw it out and said, you don't need that stuff, man, and gave him a place where he was accepted and cared for and loved, and that was a hate group, a neo-Nazi group, where he found family and camaraderie and a place to be when both of his parents worked all day. Going towards love can be a hate group. It could be the drama club, but that's all that it is at its root. It's just going towards where the love is and you find you're, you're going to find yourself doing a little lot all through your life and maybe wonder about it. I always think like in this cancel culture, and we all know what I'm talking about, whether you think there is one or there isn't one or where you stand on it. And there's a lot of gray matter there. But without a path to redemption, when you take someone, you found a tweet they wrote seven years ago or a thing that they said, and you expose it and you say, this person should be no more, banish them forever. They're gonna find some place where they are accepted. 
and it's not going to be with progressives, which ironically means to be changed, progress. If we don't give these people a path to redemption, then they're going to go where they are accepted, which is the motherfucking dark side. I think there should be some kind of path. Do we want people to be changed or do we want them to stay the same, to freeze in a moment we found on the internet from 12 years ago? And so we can point to ourselves as right and them as wrong. It's righteousness it's porn. Absolutistness of the party I am in. That is such a turnoff to me. It's so fucking elitist you know for something called progressive it allows for zero progress it's all or nothing no steps toward all or fucking nothing again righteousness porn and i've been thinking about this a lot just in general i i just i don't know that i want to be associated with any party I really, I think I don't want to be associated with any party anymore. It just, it comes with too much baggage. Every party, it comes with so much fucking baggage that no ideas can be taken at face value. And without ideas, what are we? Without a common truth, how can we talk about it? You know, Republicans might hear an idea that they would totally agree with, but if it comes from AOC, then they hate it. And of course, you know, to be honest, when I hear an idea that comes from a Republican, it's suspect to me. We all put, we all put too much shit on this stuff. We no longer are able to be a nation of ideas. It's good, bro you up to uh nothing much just looking up old videos and old tweets on celebrities trying to get them canceled cancel yeah um it's when you jeopardize the livelihood and reputation of someone based on something they did in the past oh why i'm a part of the most toxic community on the internet it's what we do okay yep we have to hold people accountable for what they've done in the past regardless of who they are today we don't judge people based on who they are now we judge them on who they were. Hmm, I see. Honestly, to cancel someone, it doesn't even have to be something they did in the past. It could be something they did today. Or something we think that they might do tomorrow. Shit. Nowadays, we cancel people for no reason. You can do absolutely nothing. We'll cancel you. The most effective way to cancel someone is to create our own narrative and turn a subgroup against that celebrity. What do you mean? Okay, like J. Cole, for instance. He said in a recent song, it's something about this queen's tone that's bothering me. We took that line, twisted it, and we created the narrative that says J. Cole is telling black women to watch their tone, telling them to shut the fuck up and sit down. Now J. Cole is a misogynist that hates black women. Is that what he meant? Was that the intent? Probably not. But that's the thing with cancel culture. We create our own narratives. We don't follow logic or facts. We follow the herd. Oh. So, so what do y'all get out of all this? I don't know. But sometimes we bully people into apologizing just to say that their apology isn't sincere. <laughs> it's fucking great. Wow. This, this video isn't even funny. No, this is just actually sad. And it's it, this is life. And I don't even know how to end this video. Ideological subversion is, is the process which is legitimate, overt, and open. You, you can see it with your own eyes. All, all you have to do, all American mass media has to do is to unplug their bananas from their ears, open up their eyes, and they can see it. There is no mystery. There is nothing to do with espionage. I know that espionage intelligence gathering looks more romantic. It sells more deodorants through the advertising, probably. That's why your Hollywood producers are so crazy about James Bond type of, of, of thrillers. But in reality, 
the main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of its intelligence at all. According to my uh, opinion and opinion of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money, and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, active мероприятия in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Chapter 2. Subverting Negro Churches Created doubt, lack of confidence, suspicion, setting up situations that bring about racial bitterness, violence, and conflict, putting forth demands so unrealistic that race relations are worsened, attacking everybody in disagreement as reactionaries, fascists, Ku Kluxers among whites, and Uncle Tom's among Negroes constitute the Reds' pattern of operation. Fortunately, the overwhelming majority of Negroes, in whose name the Communists and their ilk presume to speak, have not fallen for the blandishments of the Reds. They know a red light when they see one. The same cannot be said of many Negro intellectuals carrying the ball for the Communists. Since the Communists have always looked upon Negro intellectuals as shallow, superficial, phase-mongers and incompetents, looking for a loaf when they, on a basis of ability, are not worthy of a crumb, their pro-Communist behavior becomes all the more tragic and ludicrous. Only after the order came from Moscow in the 1934-35 period to win over the Negro intellectual by deceptive flattery and adulation did the Reds' public attitude toward them change. The Kremlin concluded that these superficial phonies could serve the cause of communism. A large number of Negro ministers are all for the communists. Some are prominent and influential. Others are run-of-the-mill. They in common believe that beating the racial drum is a shortcut to prominence, money, and the realization of personal ambitions even if the Negro masses are left prostrate and bleeding, expendables in the mad scramble for power. Abner W. Berry, columnist in The Daily Worker, official organ of the Communist Party, recently praised these ministers as fulfilling their historic role, i.e. delivering the Negro into the hands of the Communists. Neither his pen nor his lips had such praise prior to the 1934-35 period. Then the Moscow line was clear. The resolution on the Negro question stated, in the work among the Negroes, special attention should be paid to the role played by the churches and preachers who are acting on behalf of American imperialism. The party must conduct a continuous and carefully worked out campaign among Negro masses, sharpened primarily against the preachers and the churchmen, who are the agents of the oppressors of the Negro race. All the instructions from Moscow at the time ordered Reds to combat the influence of the church because the church, by offering the Negro worker and peasant for the miseries they are enduring in this world, compensation in heaven, are befogging the minds of the Negro workers and peasants, making them a helpless prey to capitalism and imperialism. The public denunciation of Negro sky politics was likewise stopped on orders from Moscow. The deeply religious Negro masses, whom the Kremlin wanted to use as expendables in the struggle for power, shied away from the party. A frontal attack on religion resulted in isolation from Negroes, therefore deception was to be tried. The honeyed face replaced harsh words, the smile replaced the smirk, the velvet glove covered the mailed fist, humility replaced arrogance, the handshake replaced hostility. All that was distasteful and wicked in the past was to be forgotten in the face of a need for a common front against the white oppressors. The devil was sick, an angel he would be. Application of the new line embarked the communists on an era of outstanding success in infiltrating and penetrating the Negro church. White ministers acting as missionaries, using the race angle as bait, aided in the cultivation of Negro ministers for work in the red solar system of organizations. Bribery through gifts, paid lectures, flattery through long applause at staged rallies, favorable mention in the red-controlled press were not the only methods employed to corrupt the Negro ministers. The use of sex and perversion as a means of political blackmail was an accepted red tactic.
At the same time that all this was going on at the top, the comrades were building cells below in the church to guarantee that decisions made at the top would be brought down to the congregation. The importance attached to this work is clearly shown in the report of the speeches of Earl Browder, then General Secretary of the Communist Party, and Gerard Eisler, alias Edwards, Moscow representative to the plenary session of the National Committee of the Communist Party in the United States. It states, Comrades Browder, Edwards, and Ford have spoken about the necessity of making a turn in our Negro work, how to connect ourselves with the organized masses, and the United States there are, of the Negro population, 10 million in churches. The problem of how to penetrate these organizations is of the utmost political importance. The bulk of the Negro church members are in the South. They live by the good book. Anyone against the good book is of the devil. There is no in-between. The red carpet baggers discovered this when they touched the Negro's religion, so they avoided this sore spot in order to snare their intended victims. Get them involved in the movement first and later do the job on their religious convictions was the order. Anything else was putting the cart before the horse. The new line went like this. Jesus, the carpenter, was a worker like the communists. He was against the money changers, the capitalists, the exploiters of that day. That is why he drove them from the temple. The communists are the modern-day fighters against the capitalists or the money changers. If Jesus were living today, he would be persecuted like the communists who seek to do good for the common people. Law enforcement agents made it extremely difficult and hazardous for the Reds to work openly. Consequently, they drew heavily upon accumulated knowledge and experience of their comrades engaged in illegal work in other parts of the world to operate with the least risk in the South. Of all their methods used, it was generally agreed that the church is the best cover for illegal work. Gilbert Green, one of the top Reds in this country, reported as follows. For example, in the South we have more than 300 members who are also members of the church youth organizations, especially the Baptist Young People's Union. In this district, Alabama, where possible we should build units in the church youth organizations. Why? Because in the South, especially for the Negro youth, the church is the center of cultural and social activity. It is here that we must work. By building our units in the church organizations, we can also improve our work under the illegal conditions, as it will be easier to work in the church organizations. In Alabama, there are certain places in which we can, in a short while, take over the church organizations of youth under our leadership, and these can become legal covers for our work in the South. The first paragraph in this chapter mirrors today's prodding of the incitement of racial conflict, as Johnson wrote created doubt, lack of confidence, suspicion, setting up situations that bring about racial bitterness, violence, and conflict, putting forth demands so unrealistic that race relations are worsened, attacking everybody in disagreement as reactionaries, fascists, Ku Kluxers among whites, and Uncle Toms amongst Negroes. The terms used to discredit people's opinions today are similar to Johnson's time. If you do not agree, to any degree, with the left-wing authoritarians of culture and politics, you will be called a fascist or a member of the KKK. However, the vernacular has grown to a wider scale since the 1930s. Not only will you be called a fascist or some sort of clan slur, common slanderous terms used today are the following. Nazi, racist, sexist, homophobe, transphobe, xenophobe, Islamophobe, and in general, adding the ending particles of phobe, phobic, ists, and isms to any word. In the black community, while still using Uncle Tom, have added coon, race traitor, and house nigger. During Johnson's time, religion was a strong avenue of subversion for the communists. In my time, subversion is utilized through infinite routes beyond religion, academia, culture, and pop culture, such as movies, music, TV shows, commercials, sports, games, comic books, cartoons, and social media trends. There is no place the communist ideology will not take advantage of. The goal is to take control of social and cultural influence of all communities, be it black, white, red, yellow, or brown. In this way, they can then influence the people involved in those cultural and social activities and indoctrinate them with corrupted ideas. Subversion of culture is prominent everywhere. For example, Cartoon Network. All right, class. Can anyone tell me who invented the light bulb? Thomas Edison! That's not entirely true. The light bulb could more rightfully be attributed to Louis Latimer, the black inventor behind the filament inside the bulb. 
Hughes' invention made light bulbs affordable and efficient enough for the general public, bringing electric light into households around the world. Well, so, so now, now you, you know. know. Wait, is that it? Hold on. We're not going to mention why he invented the filament? To create a better standard of living for people who had only just been freed from slavery? Are we going to ask why kids are apparently learning about Thomas Edison? Thomas Edison! Ugh. And not learning about Louis Latimer? These textbooks are incomplete. There were black Roman warriors, black medieval knights, black classical musicians, black cowboys, black fighter pilots. Where are they? I worry about you humans because you only live, what, about a hundred years? You rely on these stories to know your own history. Thanks to systemic racism, most of your storytellers prioritize white accomplishments, which leaves you with an incomplete picture. Ask yourself as you're learning history, who's telling the story? Was this modified to make white readers comfortable? Are major details being left out that would credit people of color and center their point of view? Honestly, I should have asked for script approval before agreeing to do this. We'll do some rewrites. I'm sorry. We didn't know. Well, so now you know. I swear. This Cartoon Network segment was created after a widely shared post on social media claimed that Thomas Edison did not invent the light bulb, but stole it from a black man named Louis Latimer. Latimer did invent a longer-lasting filament, as the character had said in the video. That much is true. But he did not invent the actual light bulb, as that Cartoon Network segment is leading viewers to believe. Not only that, but the character in this segment goes on a race rant that seemed to be the real purpose of the video. They just needed a black figure from history to propel the topic into that identity politics talking point. Critical race theory is being pushed to some degree in nearly every part of our society, from the public sector to the private, public schools to military. Cottage Core, also known as Farm Core and Country Core, is an aesthetic inspired by a romanticized interpretation of Western agricultural life. It is centered on ideas of a more simple life and harmony with nature. However, even something as simple as this fashion trend is being divided for racial reasons. Take, for example, this woke TikToker, utilizing critical race theory to discourage involvement in this trend, which is supposedly problematic. The issue with Cottage Core is that it was designed by white sapphics, for white sapphics, and now we're retroactively trying to fit people of color into an aesthetic that isn't really designed for them. And I think that's an issue with a lot of things within the LGBT community. The content and culture that white queers create is more palatable to those outside of the community and to the other white queers within the community. Talking about cottagecore specifically, it romanticizes a colonialist homesteading ideal. The idea that there are these open, unclaimed lands that you can go live on does seem a little manifest destiny. And the idea that the rural with its old ways is somehow inherently more moral and wholesome than the city, when rural areas tend to be more conservative and white and urban areas tend to have more people of color, sounds like familiar rhetoric. And even if that rhetoric isn't intentional, there's something uncomfortable with predominantly white people choosing to glorify and romanticize a colonial past. The definition of religion, the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal god or gods, a particular system of faith and worship, a pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance. Everyone has a religion. It is impossible not to have a religion if you are a human being. It's in our genes and has expressed itself in every culture, in every age, including our own secularized section of society. Even today's atheists are expressing their own form of religious practice. Their denial of any god is as absolute as others' faith in God, and entails just as much a set of values to live by, including for some daily rituals like meditation, which is a form of prayer. The Seven Types of Atheism is a book written by John Gray, who stated, Religion is an attempt to find meaning in events, not a theory that tries to explain the universe. Religion was created for many reasons, one of them being that we, humans, are the only species, so far as we know, who have evolved to know explicitly that one day in the future, we will die. This existential fact requires some way of us reconciling with that while we are still alive. And unlike any humans before us, we take those who are much closer to death than we are and isolate them in nursing homes where they cannot remind us of our own mortal fate in our daily lives. 
This is why science cannot replace religion. Science does not tell you how to live or what life is about. It only provides hypothesis and application of knowledge when understanding the natural and social world following a systematic methodology based on evidence. But science is not about ultimate meaning and morality. Art can provide a form of meaning in our daily lives, but appreciating great art or music is mainly done so in admiration, fascination, and contemplation. Art does not determine a way of life. It is mainly a reflection of it. We are a meaning-seeking species. When you accomplish your meaningful goals, or if others have accomplished them before you, what meaning do you have left? To many, it leaves them with nothing to live for in their current circumstance, which is why I hypothesize. This is why so many left-wing-minded people in America hold on to the past sins of our country, as if they are still true today. These people have nothing to live for, so they are bringing back these sins from the past, so they have something meaningful to fight for in the present. In conclusion, separating the meaningful practice of religion from people is vital for communist dominance. Because if your ultimate meaning is derived from religious faith, you have less need of deriving it from Marxism or other left-wing ideology or trusting entirely in a single secular leader. When your connection to religion remains strong, politics is merely there for procedures of coexistence between different groups of people. This is the battle Christianity is facing in our current era of Western society. If Christianity falls, communism will replace it under the deceptive mask of peace and equality which is going to be led by the combined cult of left-wing ideologies, social justice, and critical race theory. Father, please walk with us through the bad times as well as the good. May we be heard and understood from the suburbs to the hood. May you judge us by our hearts and not by our mistakes. And see that we get our breakthrough, however long that it takes. May you feel that void in our souls. We will lay our fears to rest. But there's no way we can live for Jesus when we're living in the flesh. So I pray that you allow our spirits to be born, grow strong, move on. No, right from wrong. First John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. And we know what that means. But listen. Chapter 3. Red Plot to Use Negroes Stirring up race and class conflict is the basis of all discussion of the Communist Party's work in the South. The evil genius Stalin and other megalomaniacal leaders in Moscow ordered the use of all racial, economic, and social differences, no matter how small or insignificant, to start local fires of discontent, conflict, and revolt. Who could tell which of these issues could start a general conflagration that would sweep across the former Confederate states from Maryland to Texas? Black rebellion was what Moscow wanted. Bloody racial conflict would split America. During the confusion, demoralization and panic would set in. Then finally, the Reds say, Workers stop work. Many of them seize arms by attacking arsenals. Many had armed themselves before. Street fights become frequent. Under the leadership of the Communist Party, the workers organized revolutionary committees to be in command of the uprising. Armed workers seized the principal government offices, invade the residences of the president and his cabinet members, arrest them, declare old regime abolished, establish their own power. The only fear of the white communist leaders was that as a result of their efforts, this black rebellion would break out before they were ready in the decisive industrial cities of the north. What if one or five million Negroes die in the abortive attempt to establish a Negro republic? Is not the advance of the cause worth it? A communist is not a sentimentalist. He does not grieve over the loss of life and the advancement of communism. This plot to use the Negroes as the spearhead or as expendables was concocted by Stalin in 1928, nearly 10 years after the formation of the World Organization of Communism. Prior to this time, the periodic Moscow gatherings did little more than pass resolutions. Any credits for the changes belongs, in the main, to a handful of Negro lickspittles like James W. Ford, Harry Haywood, Otto Hall, Lovett Fort Whitman, and Otto Huswit, to mention a few. They were the ones who, again and again, begged their masters in Moscow to force the white leaders of the Communist Party in the United States to organize and use the Negroes. 
They were the ones who got in on the ground floor of the conspiracy. They are the ones that history may well record as the political Uncle Toms who plotted with a diabolical alien power, the moral decay, physical slavery, and spiritual death of their own race. The perfidy of these Negro Reds is all the more infamous when one reads from the pen of a top Negro communist who wrote, A. Prior to the Sixth Congress, white chauvinism, or Red Prejudice, made progress in Negro work well nigh impossible. B. White chauvinism manifests itself in open or concealed opposition and doing work among Negroes. C. The tendency was to ignore the leading Negro comrades when formulating policy. D. As punishment for their opposition, the Negro comrades were refused financial support in getting out the weekly news service, which was being sent out to some 300 Negro newspapers. E. Negro comrade was disciplined for his insistence in bringing before the conference at the tabooed question of Negro work. The above read author gives James W. Ford credit for his bringing this matter to the attention of the white fathers in Moscow, which resulted in immediate action. Negro communists were given jobs in the apparatus. Most of them were given professional revolutionary training in the United States and Russia under direct orders from Stalin. As a result, Negro Reds began looking to Moscow. Stalin became the great and just father, who could be relied upon to settle the many differences between white and Negro communists. During the three decades which have elapsed since the Sixth World Congress in Moscow, the American Communist Party has conducted many campaigns and formed and infiltrated a large number of organizations among Negroes. From the bloody gun battles at Camp Hill, Alabama, 1931, to the present integration madness, the heavy hand of communism has moved, stirring up racial strife, creating confusion, hate, and bitterness so essential to the advancement of the Red cause. One may recall organizations formed, directed, controlled, and led by Reds and fellow travelers such as American Negro Labor Congress, League of Struggle for Negro Rights, International Labor Defense, National Negro Congress, Sharecroppers Union, the Civil Rights Congress, Negro Labor Victory Committee, Southern Negro Youth Congress, Negro Labor Councils, etc. Ad infinitum that exposed millions of Negroes to communist ideas. The list of sponsors, officers, and contributors reads like a who's who in the Negro intellectual, professional, labor, and religious circles. Through the aforementioned organizations and many others, Negro institutions of higher education like Howard University were penetrated to subvert teachers and students and thus politically contaminate the intellectual stream of Negro life. White leftists descended on Negro communities like locusts, posing as friends come to help liberate their black brothers. Along with these white communist missionaries came the Negro political Uncle Tom to allay the Negro's distrust and fears of these strangers. Everything was interracial and interracialism artificially created, cleverly devised as a camouflage of the red plot to use the Negro. As early as 1928, the communists declared that the racial differences among our people constituted the weakest and most vulnerable point in our social fabric. By constantly probing and straining at this one spot, they calculated that eventually the cloth could be torn apart and that Americans could be divided, weakened, and perhaps even set against each other in open combat. We mustn't kid ourselves into thinking that the communists have placed their agitators only into the black communities. They're working both sides of the street. They want hatred, violence, and bloodshed between the races, and they don't care how they get it or whom they use, even children if necessary. Here is a book that I think ought to be in every home library. It's entitled, Color, Communism, and Common Sense by Manning Johnson. He joined the party as a young man because he honestly believed that the communists were trying to improve the conditions of his people. He was a dedicated communist, and eventually he rose to one of the highest ranks. But after many years, he discovered that instead they were merely planning to use his people in a bloody revolution to destroy America. And when he woke up to this, he dropped out of the party and devoted the rest of his life trying to alert his fellow citizens of all races to the true nature of the Communist Party as he knew it to be from the inside. Orchestrating race and class conflict is the base of the Communist strategy. Divide and conquer, as the classic saying goes. People who hold any kind of public presence in the black community, whether it is an intellectual, an influencer, or a public figure of some sort. 
have used their positions of influence to instill an indoctrinated belief through the mental and spiritual position of what it means to be black for decades. The communists have weaponized this Achilles heel against the black community from its inception. Maybe you know a few people who have had their black card revoked by the community for not behaving according to the minds of black nationalists. Here's an interview with Terry Crews explaining this very problem. When you're talking about MLK, you talk about Nelson Mandela and even Malcolm X, they all realized that you had to have a non-racial component to these kind of movements or there will be resentment. There will be get back. There will be one of these people will tend to you know, listen. I don't want to move from one oppressor to the next. And one thing is really who's, shocks who's me. the next oppressor? At, who's the next oppressor? Oh, when I when I describe this, when you look in the city of Chicago, there are nine children who died by gun violence, by black on black gun violence, with from June twentieth all the way to today. And you're talking about even with the Atlanta child murders, there were 28 kids who were, who died during, in two years. You're talking about a month and you have nine black kids. And the Black Lives Matter movement has said nothing about this. What does kind that of have thing? to do you know, with equality, though, it, Terry? I have to tell I don't understand what that has to do with equality because they're they're Listen, there's crime. There are people in those communities who are those people aren't just being nonchalant about about gun violence. I lived in Chicago. There are many people who are working in those communities. Right to try to get rid of the gun violence. It's pr the gun culture in this, in this country is prevalent, but I don't understand what that has to do with a movement that's for equality for black people. It's, it, it, there, it's not mutually exclusive that if you care about equality for black people, that somehow you're going to stop um, random violence or unfortunately kids from being shot. It just seems like apples and oranges. You know, it, 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 it's not that way. You know, this is the thing, Don. You know, black people need to hold other black people accountable. I said this the same thing. If we, this is a, a, the black America's version of the Me Too movement. If anything is going to change, we ourselves need to look at our own communities and look at each other and say, this thing cannot go down. And, and this is the thing, too. There are a lot of great, great people there who are held hostage, who are held hostage by people who literally are, are, are running these neighborhoods with violence and then claiming that Black Lives Matter. When you look at the parents of these little kids who are mentioning, saying, hey, man, why aren't they speaking up for me, too? It is important for the people who follow the ideology of communism and socialism to infiltrate organizations, especially based on activism, that have any racial or biological element to them. Manning Johnson listed several in the chapter. Today, the socialists and communists have gone beyond using the black community and have spread their ideology into many circuits. They use organizations that cater to any small differentiating communities in our society. Feminists and the LGBTQIA community have been under that microscope for the last few decades, and the corruption of these groups has only gotten more potent as time has gone on. A prime example is the Women's March. Vanessa Rubel, who was a founder of the organization in 2017, has since left in 2019, but had a specific request for the branding of the Women's March during its founding, which was to base it on the intersectional divide between women of color. The downfall of the Women's March is the constant clout chasing for publicity. They pursue any issue that is guaranteed to get the organization viral media coverage, while separating women based on intersectionality, specifically white women, who are not welcome in the movement along with Jewish women. These socialists and communists in America swarm like locusts, still posing as friends who have come to liberate all these different communities. In reality, they liberate no one and contaminate every community they go into with their corrupted ideas. There are many whites who are trying to solve the problem, but you never see them going under the label of liberals. That, that white person that you see calling himself a liberal is the most dangerous thing in the entire Western Hemisphere. He's the most deceitful. He's like a fox, and a fox is, almost, is always more dangerous in the forest than the wolf. You can see the wolf coming. You know what he's up to, but the fox will fool you. He comes at you with his mouth shaped in such a way that even though you see his teeth, you think he's smiling and taking for a friend. Consider buying a Stars and Stripes Freedom Deck to support my educational series, available from La Loteria Loca.
Download and archive these chapters, or rip them off the site you're viewing them on, and save them while you can, just in case this current channel gets shut down for covering any of these topics. Before we begin, keep in mind the vocabulary and vernacular written in this book was common practice from a different time in our history. If you are sensitive to the use of such language, you will completely miss the message and the hard work that Manning Johnson sacrificed for the improvement and safety of our country. Our nation has been manipulated by utilizing division in our communities by Marxist ideology. I would agree that uh, no doubt there have been a large number of, of whites who have posed as liberals and as friends of the Negro and who have time and again betrayed the Negro. Uh, on the other hand, I think one could point to a large number of whites uh, who have struggled for civil rights, Give me for equality, example. and have got little or nothing out of it, uh, other than uh, quite a few bruises. Give me an example. Well, the, the large number of, of white uh, students who have gone into the South, for example, working for SNCC and other organizations. Not working for SNCC or other organizations, but working for uh, the white uh, political machines who benefit by the voting uh, efforts of Negroes. Okay. I'll be more specific. Uh, I would cite Herbert Hill, for example, as, an, <laughs> as, as a kind of person who has uh, championed Negro job rights, for example, uh, in New York City and elsewhere. He has fought the political machine. First time I met Herbert Hill personally was when they were picketing to stop the working on the uh, Harlem Hospital in Harlem. Negroes for 10 years had to fight the city to get uh, an annex built on the Harlem Hospital. Because in Harlem, we need a hospital more so than anything else. Our people are sick, plus we do a lot of cutting and shooting of each other, though we profess to be nonviolent. And uh, Herbert Hill brought his forces out and stopped the working on that site. Uh, this is the first time I ever saw him. Then uh, when work was brought to a halt on a hospital in Harlem, the same Negroes tried to uh, stop the work at the downstate uh, medical center in Brooklyn, which is predominantly white. They, they were out there for three months during the summer. Couldn't stop anything. And I never saw Herbert Hill out there one time. Now, whenever something, whenever it takes uh, a stoppage of something that's going to affect the white man, you find the white liberal absent. But if, when it uh, involves something that primarily will affect the best interests of black people and black people only, then that white liberal is present. Herbert Hill is the labor secretary for the NAACP. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if he was interested in black people, he would prepare a black man with the type of knowledge and understanding of the labor troubles involving black people that would enable uh, a black man to sit in the same position as secretary of labor or labor secretary in the NAACP. I'm suspicious of whites who join Negroes and always have to be in the lead, who always have to be the head, who always have to be at the top in Negro organizations. Those whites who really have the interest of blacks at heart, let them give some advice to some Negroes and stand on the sideline. But don't join the organization and then get at the head of it and pose as a friend of Negroes. Chapter 4. Bane of Red Integration Many Negro intellectuals, artists, professionals, etc. were carried away with this outburst of interracialism. Here was an opportunity to be accepted by the other racial group. Secretly, they had always wanted to get away from the other Negroes. Moving around among whites would somehow add to their stature and endow a feeling of importance. So they went after communists in racialism like a hog going after slop. There are numerous examples of the harmful and deadening effect of the communist interracialism integration on any proposal for constructive Negro projects. Of these examples, I will cite only a few. First, during the latter 1930s, the Negro and White Reds, fellow travelers, etc., all waged an intense campaign against Harlem Hospital in New York. Inside information supplied by Reds on the hospital staff told of crowded conditions and improper treatment. Some of this information was so derogatory that many dubbed Harlem Hospital the butcher shop. Street meetings, indoor rallies, United Front conferences made overcrowding and improper hospital treatment the main subject matter. Demands were made on the city officials for more and better hospitals without success. Charges of race discrimination filled the air. 
the Reds had a field day building up racial tensions. Everybody was talking about the overcrowding in the Harlem hospital. So a group of Negroes, believing in doing something for yourself, came up with the idea of a Negro community effort to found a hospital. They saw in such a project a chance to render great service to the people and the community and to show the nation and the world an example of Negro resourcefulness. Jews, Catholics, Presbyterians, and others founded hospitals, so why not the Negroes? The communists were not interested in a Negro hospital founded by Negroes and redounding to their credit. Such a project would take away a key issue in racial agitation and radicalization and isolate the Reds. So they acted swiftly and decisively through their Negro intellectual tools in the community to kill the project of borning. The late Claude McKay, Negro poet, whom I knew very well, wrote about it as follows. There was a project to found a Negro hospital a few years ago, but before it was launched, the idea was killed by the ostreperous and extremely vocal and effective group of Negro intellectuals who style themselves the anti-segregationists. They maintained that a Negro hospital would be an incentive to the greater segregation of Negro doctors. Preposterous is the situation in which the entire Negro minority is placed by its irrational intellectuals and their canny radical white supporters. I predict that nothing could be more effective in breaking down the barriers of segregation and compelling white doctors to recognize the merits of colored colleagues than the establishment of a great Negro hospital in Harlem. Moreover, such an institution could become an asset to the American medical profession. White doctors would be more attracted by the outstanding work of their colored colleagues, just as white educators and intellectuals were drawn to Tuskegee to study the great work of Booker T. Washington. Second, a well-known Negro real estate man called together a group of prominent Negro intellectuals and professionals for the purpose of launching a Negro housing development through the purchase of land and home construction. Such a project, he argued, would go a long way in showing the other races that Negroes can build ideal communities and maintain standards second to none. He had maps showing fine locations that even from a land purchase angle proved that it was a good investment, but he couldn't get to first base. Why? Because they were against setting up Negro communities, that is, segregating ourselves. They, he said, were all for integration in white communities. Third, a prominent Negro dentist who became well-to-do in the Negro community takes great pride in his radical views and associations. He purchased a home in a white neighborhood for $20,000. He has since added approximately $10,000 for repairs and alterations. Publicly, he boasted about his being the only Negro family in the neighborhood. He makes his money off Negroes. He is a Negro, but he doesn't want to live among them. To him, the mark of success is a good bank reserve and a home in a white neighborhood. His only fear is that his white neighbors will sell to other Negroes and move to another area. To him, and to so many others of his ilk, the very thought of members of his own race replacing his newly found white neighbors gives him conniptions. However, it makes no difference what are the circumstances. The Negro crasher of the Lily White section is sure full of cooperation and aid of the Reds and all so-called progressives to beat down and discredit the opposition. Negro integrationists in the main can be placed in three groups as follows. A. Those who seek acceptance in white communities only for themselves to the complete exclusion of other Negroes. B. Those who are paid agents of unprincipled or racketeering white real estate men exploiting the anxieties and fears of the white community to reap a financial bonanza. C. Those who are blockbusters, that is, a Negro family for whom the Reds or so-called progressives have purchased or rented a home or an apartment with the full knowledge that its transfer is going to arouse social resentment, bitterness, and hostility. Regardless of the group into which the Negro integrationist falls, he is like the manna from heaven to all those who deliberately seek to arrest the steady advancement in race relations and turn it into shambles for alien or partisan political purposes. Significant it is to note that the Reds and so-called progressives never spend money on projects to help the Negroes unless these projects pay off in race conflict and animosity. They know that the blockbuster, like the interloper and party crashers, is always resented and usually gets a bum rush. That is why they seek to cast the Negro in such a light. It builds up hidden resentment that can be exploited. Some people describe New York City as a melting pot. At best, this is only wishful thinking. 
the numerous racial and national groups are as easily identified today as ever. The geographical areas where each group settled or resettled remains. Thus, there are in New York German sections, Italian sections, Irish sections, Jewish sections, Puerto Rican sections, Chinese sections, Negro sections, etc. In short, there may be found as many sections as there are national groups or races, national, social, cultural, linguistic, religious, and other common factors affect this sectional cleavage. Parades and gala affairs in national costumes are not uncommon. The same may be said of every part of our country. Though these national, racial, and religious differences divide them like five fingers on the hand, yet they are one solid fist as Americans. The communists try to exploit these national, racial, and religious differences in order to weaken, undermine, and subjugate America to Moscow. Like a serpent, they use guile to seduce each group. At no time have the communists even hinted or suggested to any group other than the Negro that their clannishness or tendency to colonize a given area creates a ghetto or quarters. Were they to do so, they would be jeered out of each section as crackpots. Evidently, the Reds had international propaganda in mind when they described Negro sections as ghettos, because the definition of the word ghetto in no way applies to a Negro section any more than it does to a German, Irish, Jewish, Chinese, or any other section in America. The Encyclopedia Britannica states, Ghetto, formerly the street or quarter of a city in which Jews were compelled to live, enclosed by walls and gates which were locked each night. The term is now used loosely of any locality in a city or country where Jews congregate. During the Middle Ages, the Jews were forbidden to leave the ghetto after sunset when the gates were locked, and they were also imprisoned on Sundays and all Christian holy days. Negroes band together in sections like other races and national groups much for the same reasons. Like other racial and national groups, they can buy land, build communities, settle in any section of the country, like other racial and national groups, they can make their sections as nice and as attractive as possible. The maximum business, cultural, sanitary, and other social services are within their reach as with other groups. The communists, through propaganda, have sold a number of Negro intellectuals the idea that the Negro section is a ghetto, that white Americans created it, set its geographical boundaries, that it is a product of race hate and the inhumanity of white Americans. Therefore, it is a struggle of Negro against white oppressors for emancipation. Naturally, those holding such views have no community pride, no interest in doing anything to improve its services because that would be aiding and abetting the segregation and maintenance of the ghetto. Moreover, they oppose any race project inside or outside of the Negro section for the same reason. Everything has to be integrated or it is taboo. In this way, they paralyze Negro initiative and resourcefulness, casting the race in the mold of one that is incapable of producing anything for the advancement of society. At the same time, it creates the impression among other racial groups that the Negro awaits for them to prepare the banquet so that he can step in and enjoy it. Obviously, this line, deliberately spread by the communists, leads to the worst kind of mischief. It strengthens and creates racial prejudices and lays the basis for sharp racial conflicts. Shirking social responsibility and blaming others may be the easy way, but it is only a shortcut to communist slavery. There is nothing wrong with integrating into a society if you are coming together with people from a different culture. But to think of multiculturalism as a positive thing for society is naive. Not all cultures are compatible with each other, and misleading a society to believe that there will be no conflict between them is a perfect gambit for socialism and communism to exploit. In my generation, the Americans primarily on the left have already been indoctrinated by socialist or communist ideology and are quick to infiltrate a project introduced to improve a special interest community, especially if it was found by said community. If it doesn't add to the agitation or radicalization of those special interests communities, then it is of no benefit to the socialists or the communists. Their only goal is to divide and conquer. Throughout the history of those who carry out Marxist tactics, it is paramount to use the division of people by language, class, color, creed, religion, sexual orientation, and any differences that are apparent in a society. These differing communities are purposely agitated and divided for partisan political purposes to advance their system of government. 
Language in specific is manipulated, much like in the way George Orwell wrote in the dystopian novel 1984. Newspeak, Doublethink, Joy Camp, and so on. 1984 was written as an observation Orwell had made on the socialist behavior in Europe and how its effect works on society. Today, particles are added to the end of words to indicate the person of the subject of the particle is some kind of sinner in this new religion of social justice. Some particles being phobia, phobic, ists, or isms, and adding additional buzzwords to give the ad hominem more weight. A common example is homophobia or homophobic. Left-wing people throw this term around like it justifies their misinformed arguments based only on their personal feelings. But it is our responsibility as citizens to be intellectually trained to combat the misuse of such language. Such as this example with Dr. Umar Johnson after being questioned about his use of language in regards to the LGBTQ plus IA community. I do appreciate you addressing my concerns regarding uh, anti-LGBT rhetoric and anti-feminist rhetoric, so I appreciate you saying that up front. So, my question is, uh, the exact definition of hate speech is speech that offends, threatens, insults groups based on race, color, religion, natural or origin, sexual orientation, disability, or other traits. That is the definition of hate speech. We can say all day long that we don't hate a particular type of person, but I want to know how is that rhetoric any different than white folks that say that black people are thugs, are mentally not together, that we are in, unintelligent. How is it possible? How is that not different as a black man saying that black feminists are ugly, saying that queer people are, you said it earlier, I can see you on tape. How is that different than saying that gay people are molested, that we are pedophiles? How is that any different than white people? He has said that online, and I have the video. Yes, you have. No, you did say that online. What Dr. Umar Johnson stated earlier that evening. I was accused and derided, as some of you guys know, because of my position on sexual confusion in the African American community. And I understand we may have a few visitors tonight, and I don't mind, okay, of that community. And so I think it's important that I clarify my perspective on black homosexuality and lesbianism so that we're all crystal clear on where I stand. Yes, it is true I do not support it. Yes, it is true I do not condone it. But it is absolutely false if anyone says that Dr. Umar Johnson hates any of my brothers and sisters who practice a traditional lifestyle, tra excuse me, a non-traditional lifestyle form of, of marriage. Right, so, my, so my question is, how is this anti-woman, anti-gay rhetoric any different than white folks who say that black people are dumb, that we're thugs? Homophobia is hate speech, and anti-womanist is hate speech. Okay. May I respond? Yeah. You can! All right. Now first we got to take the emotionalism out of it, so we won't be able to dialogue, okay? And because I got ADHD, I didn't remember everything, but I think I could get to most of the highlights of what you said. First, you said homophobia. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> oh, you're going to tell me that it's a mental illness from an outdated DSM-3 that was abolished in 1973? Don't try it. <laughs> <laughs> That's like history. This is not the DSM-5. DSM-5? This is the DSM-5. Oh, we're mentally ill. <laughs> Homosexuality was a mental illness in this book until 1974. But since you brought it up, I'll start with that. If you read the American Psychological, excuse me, American Psychiatric Association position paper on the removal of homosexuality from this book as a mental illness, and I have it, it's available online, it clearly says that we did not change this classification because we had sufficient evidence to prove that people were born this way. So one of the questions that got to be dealt with from the Eurocentric mental health framework that we're dealing with this issue in, why was it removed? Now, having said that, I picked up the book to ask you on what page is the mental illness homophobia? It's not a mental illness. It's a, it's a disease just like racism a disease. Who defined homophobia as a disease? This is the authority of mental illness. Where is the diagnosis homophobia? 
It's not a diagnosis. It's, it's a it's a state no, a of being. It's a state of no, being. No phobia. It's a state a phobia. of being. A phobia okay. is in this book. Okay, so he's and teaching against people. And a phobia. Let me. Okay. Phobia is fear. Simple phobia. Any type of claustrophobia. It's a fear. You said homophobia. I'm not afraid of nobody. <laughs> okay. I've been asked by homosexuals and lesbians to have conversations with them on their radio shows. I normally accept the invitation for respectful dialogue. I don't run from the opportunity if it's going to be respectful. Now, I stand by my position as a psychologist as an educator, as a therapist for normally 20 years, and in 95% of the cases of gay and lesbians, I personally know and met and worked with, most of them were victims of sexual abuse as children. I'm speaking not what some white person wrote in some research study. I'm telling you what I know. Amongst black folk, it is a pathology born of childhood sexual victimization. Denial is at the root of all mental illness. It's easy to say I was born like this so I don't have to deal with the pain that triggered it. Now, now. Dr. Umar Johnson also explains one particular example on how language has been changed on a legal level throughout time. Now, now you, met, you said something earlier that I, I had a question about. You're a psychologist. You're a doctor. Now, you know, when I was a kid and, and there was a kid that was slow, we called him retarded. You mm -hmm. just named, you said a kid was retarded earlier. That's but, a diagnosis. Right, but people Oh, are, the retarded is the actual diagnosis. Yes, but well, President Obama just retarded, changed it. I don't even know what, you, what, what do you call somebody, you, you say Down syndrome? No, mental retardation was the label until 2009. Mm -hmm. President Obama changed it to intellectual a disability because parents of mentally retarded children felt the label was too stigmatizing. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole history to MR. Before they was called retarded, they was called imbeciles. Mm -hmm. Before they was called imbeciles, they was called idiots. These were the official words. So when we call people idiots now, just in gesture, that used to be a psychological diagnosis. So it went from idiot to imbecile to mentally retarded. Now it's intellectual uh, deficiency. So Lastly, Ayan Hersi Ali also expands on the current corruption of language and fighting for free speech. I think it is very concerning, maybe even alarming, that in the United States and across Western society, we have a growing group of people who subscribe to this ideology of critical race theory. Again, I think the general public just calls it woke because that's what they call themselves. But in this ideology, yes, it's all about feelings. It's about subjectivity. There is no universal truth. And like we spoke about earlier, they do hate America and Western civilization, not just the terrible things that we did in the past, but even the good things. We are all racists. Uh, we're Islamophobes. We're transphobes. We're this phobic and that phobic. There's a rejection by the people who subscribe to this ideology of having any kind of objective truth where we can agree on what exactly racism is so that we can all fight it or what exactly, you know, homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia, what these things are so that we can fight it. There is a corruption of language. There is a corruption of the curriculum of middle school, high school, colleges. And I don't think this is going to end well if we carry on this way, because in my view, that is how the closing of minds takes place. We're basically closing the minds of young people. People now in college, and the reason why they don't want me to come and speak in some of these colleges, or the reason why they don't want you to go and speak in these colleges is because you are going to violate their safe spaces. We are accused of microaggressions. I've been doing this book promotion that is really about women's rights and women's magazines will not respond, won't have me because some of their employees might not feel safe. So it's getting pretty ridiculous and 
I think four or five years ago, I used to laugh it off. And now watching people being canceled, people losing their livelihoods, people in academic life saying, you know, I wanted to do research on this topic, but I don't think I'm going to do it anymore because I don't want to deal with the trouble that that's going to cause me. So this is now getting not just into free speech, it's going getting into academic freedom. It is a hostility to science. It's a hostility to the constitution, which we all think is, in my view, the best document ever devised, the best political document ever devised. So I, I'm more than concerned. I think it's alarming. And I hope that people now wake up and understand that it's not just something that you can let it just happen. It's a fad. It's going to blow. It won't. It's getting worse and worse. Chapter 5. Destroying the Opposition No small amount of support of the communist cause came from important and influential Negro newspapers. The late Robert Miner, a top red, wrote, In some of these papers repeatedly appear open admissions that the Communist Party is the only party that advocates or fights for equal rights for Negroes and the right of self-determination for the Negro people. He cited two of many examples of this reaction of the Negro press. Because of lack of space, I shall quote only three excerpts from one of his examples. No menacing reds. From Afro-American Baltimore. The reds are going our way. Like ourselves, they represent a feared and hated cause. They are the first white group since emancipation to advocate race, social equality, and intermarriage for those who wish it. In fact, there is more real Christianity among white communists than in the white YMCA the white Christian endeavor societies, or the white so-called Christian churches. The Reds are no menace to Negroes. In fact, it is comforting to find groups of such people as communists in this color-mad world. There were also Negro intellectuals, artists, professionals, politicians, etc., seeking a ladder to success. They are used according to the strategic needs of the Communist Party. In preparation for their treacherous role, the party passes along the word covertly or openly to give them preferred treatment. Forces, money, publicity, etc. are used in the build-up to change comparative Negro unknowns into national and international race leaders. Wires were pulled in local, state, and federal governments to appoint, upgrade, and transfer to strategic positions Negroes whom the communist apparatus could use. Congressional records show that an internationally prominent Negro was aided in his rise by a red spy, Agler Hiss. We have never heard of this same Negro ever recommending any qualified member of his own race as a government appointee. The record does show that he recommended white appointees, later shown to be connected with the communist conspiracy. Take also the example of a well-known Negro federal judge who made two rulings in favor of the criminal communist conspiracy. He was known as a communist fronter before he was appointed. He is hailed in the red press and was boomed for the Supreme Court. In both instances, the long-range investment of the communists paid off. Similar examples can be cited again and again. As a result, belief has grown among Negro opportunists that if you want to get ahead, play ball with the Reds. Whenever the Reds do a successful job on a so-called renegade or militant anti-communist, it rivets tighter the conspiratorial cover of the party. To ensure this end, nothing is more enlightening than a few object lessons. The awesome spectacle of the array of forces in all walks of life, potent with ample money, cold-bloodedly and efficiently going about the job of destroying the reputation and influence of those designated as enemies of communism, keep many in line and enforce silence. And two, the hand of the assassin is used in some instances where it can be done with impunity. Few men want the medicine the Reds gave to the late Senator Joseph McCarthy, which the Reds boast is the best cure for militant anti-communists. Also, among these at the top of the list of Red victims are George Hewitt, alias Timothy Tim Holmes, William Bill Noel, and Charles White, all murdered. They were Negro professional revolutionists having received their training in the Lenin Institute in Moscow, USSR. Years of experience on all levels of the communist apparatus eminently qualified them for the task of ripping the conspiratorial cover from the communist party and exposing the flagitious plot against the Negro. When these Negroes defected, they automatically became a serious threat to the party. 
Their knowledge of the inner workings of the conspiracy made them a danger to the red apparatus because they were beyond its power of discipline. Theirs was a sincere and total abandonment of communism. They knew of their own knowledge its dire threat to humanity. So they cooperated with all government agencies investigating, exposing, and prosecuting communists. As a result, they became enemies of the party apparatus, renegades of communism, and were treated like outcasts with every red hand against them. The National Disciplinary Commission of the Communist Party, feared and respected by all Reds as an arm of the Soviet secret police, placed on these defectors the word informer, the dreaded tag of the criminal underworld. This solemn pronouncement means the full treatment to show the comrades what happens to those who desert and fight the party. So complete was the campaign of slander, threats, prosecution, social ostracism, that all the above-mentioned Negro ex-reds were driven to an untimely grave. That this can happen in our republic under God is unbelievable but true. No wonder then that today the wrath of the communists is to be more feared than judgments of heaven. To sink their claws in, subvert and use the Negro people, Moscow must have loyal, dedicated, trained Negro professional revolutionists who can be easily manipulated, that is, made to follow the party line. Loyalty is placed first because the Communist Party leaders demand that loyalty to the party be placed above and before everything, and that includes race, relatives, family, and loved ones. It entails a complete surrender of the will to the communist hierarchy. A willingness to do anything, go anywhere, and say anything you are told is a condition of communist membership. Out of the fires of such exacting indoctrination and training have come the treacherous Negro Red leaders who serve faithfully their masters in the Kremlin. The James Jacksons, the Henry Winstons, the William Pattersons, the Louise Thompsons, the Maud Whites, the Harry Haywoods, the Ben Davises, the Don Wilkinsons, the James W. Fords, etc., all make up the cadre around which the present racial conflict or liberation movement is being built. Moreover, they are the ones who devise the methods and techniques used by their puppets to destroy the reputation and influence of those who stand in the way of the gathering momentum of the Negro liberation juggernaut. Except for a brief period during the latter 1930s, the Reds called those persons Uncle Toms who sought solution of the race problem through the medium of education, patience, understanding, and discussion, which would lead to a mutual agreement. Since any program leading to a peaceful solution of the race problem automatically excludes and dooms the Reds' efforts among Negroes, it goes without saying that the Reds are going to oppose it. The chief targets are the responsible advocates of such a program. They must be discredited and isolated from the masses. So in addition to the tags of enemy of the race, tool of the white ruling class, traitor to the race, the Reds have added the opprobrium of Uncle Tom. In their usual diabolically clever way, the Reds took the name of a fine, sincere, and beloved character made famous in the greatest indictment of chattel slavery and transformed him into a dirty, low, sneaky, treacherous, groveling, snivering coward. This the Reds did in order to make the name Uncle Tom the symbol of social, economic, and political leprosy. Today, the name Uncle Tom among Negroes ranks with the term McCarthyism, generally turning many ministers into moral cowards, many politicians into scared jackrabbits, and other leaders into hypocrites. No man dare stand up and proclaim convictions counter to the Red agitation without running the risk of being pilloried. The Reds, their fellow travelers, leaders of the NAACP, and other race agitators have created an ideal climate for such persecution. Ironically, the communist definition of Uncle Tom applies to the Negro Red and the fellow traveler more than it does to anyone else. In fact, I do not know of any Negro, living or dead, who sank to the depths of cowardice, servility, and treachery as has the Negro Red. One has only to read the wailings and lamentations of Pettus Perry to his white masters in the Communist Party to do something about the widespread race prejudice permeating that party from top to bottom. Such prejudice in the Communist Party, in the opinion of Pettus Perry, prevents the Communist apparatus from effectively exploiting the Negro people. As the rhythm of communist history would have it, the tactics today of using prominent black voices to influence the masses is a practice that seems to have no end. There are people in the black community who will exploit the orchestrated chaos and trauma of their community in a scramble for fame, money, and power, whether it be an artist, professor, politician, athlete, etc. There are those who seek success by any means, 
Many celebrities or people of high status maintain or replenish their status by these same means. Those means are frequently to become an activist or to present oneself as a person of superior virtue. These personality types, if not already indoctrinated by socialism or communism, are the perfect gambit in which socialists and communists can use to further their agenda. They build up these public figures through media coverage, pop culture outlets, and public speaking events. In this process, many of these figures gain the money, fame, and influence they seek, many of them naive to the fact that they are just a pawn in this Marxist method of gaining control. One primary issue these left-wing idealists have is when someone opens their eyes to the detrimental system they want to create. Should someone begin to rebel against socialism or communism, they must be made an example of. Destroying the opposition is not only limited to eradicating people who support capitalism, it is also to destroy those who once supported Marxist ideas but later came to the realization that they are contributing to the creation of a destructive system and then actively speaking against it when they have come to this realization. However, to make them regret to the greatest extent of their sin for abandoning their ideology, they are slandered, publicly shamed, and have their careers destroyed as punishment. Left-wing activists also oppose solutions if it does not involve their ideology. It is the wrong result if it does not end in the redistribution of resources from the labor produced by hard-working citizens to their special interest groups. It doesn't matter if it was a community effort or an individual effort. If it does not advance the left-wing system, it was the wrong solution. Get away, you Chapter 6. The Real Uncle Toms Ironically, after more than three decades, the Rads can't eliminate race prejudice from their own ranks. Pettis Perry's articles clearly show that the centuries-old racial, national, social, economic, and political differences between peoples plague and bedevil the communist vanguard despite indoctrination, training, discipline, and so forth. The human element resists the red straitjacket. Naturally so, because you can't level everybody off, toss them in a pot, and stir them up without producing a social disorder. The top white communist leaders know that racial, as well as other differences between peoples, have existed for over a long span of years and will continue to exist even after centuries of re-education under communist rule. They also know that these differences can be used to play race against race, nationality against nationality, class against class, etc., to advance the cause of communism. Posing as a friend of the Negro, they, under this guise of a campaign for Negro rights, set race against race in the cold-blooded struggle for power. Their hypocrisy and falsity of their claims are clearly revealed in a number of instances. For example, while the Reds and their fellow travelers were stoking the racial fires on the issue of restrictive covenants, in New York, some 46 comrades, including the chairman, signed leases containing restrictive covenant clauses. This was also true of two leading comrades in the trade union movement. Some comrades said that those involved needed a home and therefore it was all right for them to sign such clauses. While the Reds were renting apartments and subletting them to Negroes to stir up racial bitterness and hate, such as existed in Stuyvent Town in New York City, they carefully avoided living in a Negro community. A top white red was in the act of moving into the Riverton housing project in Harlem, but decided against it because, to quote him, A survey disclosed that only 5-7% to 7 of the inhabitants of the project were white families, and therefore would have been a bad environment for my kids. The white communists have nothing but contempt for Negro communists, and justly so. And this is openly expressed. For instance, White comrades living in a Negro community and holding positions in the clubs were not on speaking terms with most of the Negro comrades. Their utter hypocrisy is also revealed in the following. White comrades going into the mass organizations made up predominantly of Negro people constantly shout that we must fight for Negro rights. Yet when they meet Negro comrades and other Negro acquaintances on the street, especially in the downtown area, they do not even speak to them. Evidently, 
Fear and distrust of the Negro male is rampant in the Communist Party ranks because when the newspapers reported a case of rape, some of the white women in the party began to develop the idea that they should ask for police protection. Even the despised tools of the capitalist system, the police, are good to have around at times, say the comrades. From time to time, the communist leaders conduct a complete registration of all members. Any Negro comrade who does not register is told to do so or else. The else means loss of job, as for instance. In New Jersey, there was difficulty in re-registering a Negro woman comrade, whereupon this comrade was informed that either she re-register or else it will be your job. Thus implying that the party would use its influence to carry out the threat. Social equality for the Negro is a major slogan of the communists. They use it on one hand to mislead the Negro American, and on the other hand to create anxieties and fears among white Americans to better exploit both racial groups. What it means when applied to communists is shown as follows. A number of instances, Negro comrades are not welcome into the homes of white comrades. In some cases, they are received early in the mornings when neighbors may think they are domestic workers or are welcome at night when the neighbors of the white comrades might not see the Negro comrades at all. Space does not permit the sighting of all of the many examples of the utter hypocrisy of the white communists which show the vast gulf between what they say and what they do. These examples serve to bring into sharp focus the infamous treachery of the Negro Reds and their Negro fellow travelers and defenders. Moreover, it conjures up their own definition of Uncle Tom, which applies more to them than any other Negro. The Reds have deliberately twisted and warped the thinking of those intellectual pygmies who lead the Freedom by 63 campaign by sending them after quick solutions of a centuries-old problem that has never been solved anywhere in the world. Obvious, even to the most ignorant, is the fact that all people are prejudiced. No one is free of it. Prejudice, in one form or another, has existed as long as the human family. They arise out of the complex differences of race, nationality, religion, economic, social, and cultural standings. Prejudice is not limited to any one race. It is common to all. Neither does the color of skin determine more or less the extent of prejudice in any particular race. Much like the communists during Johnson's era, the left-wing party in my generation are notorious for introducing re-education programs through various outlets. From unconscious bias training to critical race theory, they present this idea that we are all equal. However, they categorize everyone by race, sex, and sexual preferences, then isolate the original sinner in the Western world. This is known as the cis straight white male. Then they mandate classes to re-educate white people. No matter how much indoctrination, you can still mix people from different cultures, races, religions, etc., and the leftists will still manage to discriminate against people. If you point out how the left uses race, sex, class, or any differences against each other, you will also be cast out, especially if you are in one of these minority communities. I will show you an example which was published by a taxpayer-funded program in the United Kingdom called Channel 4. It is a good exercise to make half of a society feel angry and the other half feel guilty. These kids had no expectations of being set against each other. These kids have no idea about equality of opportunity as they are too young to understand the results of meritocracy and the convenience of networking that can also result in more opportunity, which is applicable in every industry. This publicly published video funded by taxpayers by force is an effective case study in Soviet-style propagandizing. Simple exercises like this set race relations in this country back decades just by introducing it into a national curriculum to children at a young age. We are going to be running a race. <laughs> However, your starting position in this race will be decided by the answers to questions that we are going to be asking you. Okay, what? <laughs> it's a joke. This activity is intended to explore how society favours one race over others. People often confuse white privilege with being wealthy or being rich. And it isn't about that. What it's about is the absence of having to live with the consequences of racism. Now, if the question applies to you, you will take a big step forward. If the answer to the question doesn't apply to you, 
You stay where you are. I better win, man. Oh. Okay, make sure you're on the start line. I see some cheaters already. Yeah, fine. Feet behind the line. If English is your parents' first language, oh. take a step forward. Oh, yeah. If you have ever been the only person in the room of your race, take a step backwards. A pass! Oh. Ah, she's got a oh. <laughs> For God's sake! If you've never been asked where you come from, take a step forward. If you have never had to be worried about your family being stopped and searched, take a step forward. I'm not worried about if people ask me to stop and search. The divide widens and the inequality of their position becomes clear. This is just like not fair now. Far away. Far away. None of us are white. None of us are white. It's unfair. <laughs> the last question. If your parents have ever warned you about racism, take a step forward. <laughs> backwards. If we were about to start a race, is this a fair starting no. point for us all? No! no. no. <laughs> Mackay, how do you feel standing there in the field of runners? I uh, kind of feel a bit alone. A bit alone. There's, there's, uh, I, I can't really see. I'm literally just by myself, more or less. I'm just a bit, a bit frustrated and annoyed that society nowadays really isn't fair. And I just wish everybody could be equal. Farah! It's kind of frustrating that, like, me and Sarah are just standing at the back here while the majority of people who may be white are, like, standing right at the front. That just frustrates me a bit, because it's almost as in what society is today. I, w I don't want this to be how it is, but it is. So it just gets a bit frustrating. Henry. How are you feeling being right at the very front? Um, it feels quite weird because if you think about it, um, I think all of us should be at the same point. But sadly, the questions, um, the way that they were put didn't favour some people, which I think is quite unfair. On your marks. Get set. Go! Notice how in the beginning, the kids were happy being together as equals, not even noticing each other's ethnicity or gender. Now half of them feel resentment and bitterness, while the other half feels shame and guilt. This is psychological warfare. We are funding the mental manipulation to happen to our kids through taxpayer-funded public schools and even in the private sector, damaging their psychology over immutable characteristics for life. And it's done intentionally. I also noticed that the teachers didn't ask if their fathers were in the home, or if they had any siblings from different parents, or if one of their parents was incarcerated, or if their households had received government assistance. These kids didn't have any concept of what racism is until they arrived at school. In conclusion of this example, we have a better understanding as to why more and more generations are failing at basic tasks and subjects essential to life beyond school. And I'm beginning to think that diversity is not our greatest strength. Here is Dr. Omar Johnson with a solution to the education of future generations of black people. So, so okay, you want to open this school for boys, right? Frederick Douglass, Marcus Garvey Academy, and we're trying to purchase the St. Paul's College, which is a historically black college in Lawrenceville, Virginia. You went to Hampton, so you might be familiar with St. Paul's. Mm -hmm. Okay, right up the road. <laughs> <clears throat> and it's been closed since 2012. They want $2 million for the school. So I went down there, met with the president, did the tour, yada, yada. And we've been trying to raise that $2 million. So far, we raised a half of a million. Mm -hmm. Okay, we still got 1.5 more to go. I'm hoping we can get this school before someone else does. It would be perfect because it's in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. surrounded by African-American community. It would be the perfect setting to get your children out of the inner city, detox them. For the first six months, ain't no video games, ain't no none of that stuff. 
Okay, we got to remake you, detox all that filth from the hood, and we're going to teach you character, self-discipline. We will have agricultural science. They have to learn how to grow their own food. Political and military science, they have to understand the world in which they live. We're also going to give them a dietary and nutritional curriculum where they know how to eat to live because 85% of black folk are dying from preventable diet-related diseases. Them chicken wings are killing us. McDonald's, it's killing us. So they need to learn how to eat to live. There will also be a financial curriculum. Mm -hmm. By the time they finish the ninth grade, they can do their own taxes. By the time they've done the 10th grade, they will have their own business plan. By the time they've done the 11th grade, they will have their own portfolio. They will know how to invest in the stock market by the time they conclude the 11th. Who's going to pay for all this with these students, though? Well, the parents will pay tuition. Mm -hmm. And don't underestimate black parents' ability to pay tuition because they pan it at these white schools all the time. I'm doing IQ tests every day. For folks I'm looking at, I'm like, you can afford $15,000 a year? Yeah, I could do it for both my children. Even though Umar Johnson has spoken of this proposed school for nearly seven years, the community has become skeptical of his motives, as he has not laid a single brick of this project that has been ongoing forever. And people are also becoming less tolerant of his hypocritical behavior when it comes to accountability, as recently he has been getting dragged publicly for some syntactical jabs thrown by Kevin Samuels and furthermore put on the spot by a UK commentator named Jessica X for his response to Kevin's criticisms. Umar has burned a lot of bridges here. Brilliant orator, but totally corrupt. And that's the thing, words can only go so far and after a certain amount of time, we need action. Where is the school? Where is the school? Umar's been at this for years, years. And as I said before, he speaks a good game. You know, it all sounds good. And I'm here for it. I'm here for the schools. I'm here for the community growing and getting better. I'm here for it. But there has to be action. We can only have words for so long. And Umar's been at this. He's had the donations. He's had the money. But we don't have the school. The school is still not here. Kevin has these tangible results of people that we can see. Here saying, Kevin saved my marriage. I'm engaged because of Kevin. My wedding's coming up next year thanks to Kevin's advice. Where are the tangibles from from your message, Uma? Where are they? Because like I said, um, I like the idea of it, these schools to help black boys, to help the black community. I am all here for it. One thing that we can be sure about is Uma is definitely about his money. Um, and so... It's almost this mentality that if somebody is donating to somebody else, they see it as taking money out of their own pocket. And I think that's probably the way that Umar is looking at it. Regardless of Umar Johnson's snake oil salesmanship, there has been a positive movement in regards to education and preservation of future generations of proper masculinity. In Albany, Georgia, a 21-year-old man named King Randall, bought a school not only as an alternative to the unproductive and ineffective public schools, but also for troubled young men in Albany who want to better their lives. In an interview with Roland Martin, whose focus in this particular discussion was on the voting system in Georgia, Roland could not understand why Randall was taking it upon himself. Roland could not understand why Randall was taking it upon himself to improve the community instead of seeking government dependency. Why would they change the law? Because they lost. How about making a better argument for the voters? I agree with you. Uh, I do. I agree with you. I'm not against you there. Um, I definitely think uh, that is an issue that uh, I believe you guys could fight. Um, But that, again, uh, voting is not my issue to fight. I believe... So so, so what's your issue to fight? Uh, My issue, I fight for young black men before they die. Um, And that's what I do in my organization. Um, I do teach them to vote, but I don't tell them that voting is going to be the be all end all. No one says the be all the end all, but it's a part of it. But you guys, but you guys promote voting like it's just going to change like the systemic outlook of the black community. That's not where it's at. We have to get out and go do for self in our own communities. So so, so define do for self. When I say do for self, you share one of my tweets, uh, my videos, and I was actually a big fan of yours, but you share one of my tweets. Uh, when I said black people need to stop begging the government and go and do for self out in our communities, you shared the video and called me an idiot. I didn't see anything idiotic about that statement No, 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 at no. All. So when you say do for self, like what? Mm-hmm. Explain that. Okay. 
Okay, for example, uh, here in Albany, Georgia, we complain about our school systems a lot. Many of our young men can't read. Uh, they have very hor horrible literacy rates. We don't have any rehab programs here uh, for juvenile uh, offenders. What I decided to do, I started a program two years ago, decided to do for self, um, and I started taking children into my home. Uh, I started taking custody of kids from juvenile court, and I started molding them and training them and teaching them skilled trades, et cetera. Now I'm 21 years old. I just purchased a school here in Albany, Georgia to come back us being in the government funded schools that are not teaching our children's children what they need to learn. Um, so that's what I mean by do for self, simply getting up and going out and do it. So I have a question. the stereotype that I'm young black in America and I can't do anything because somebody's holding me down. So, Absolutely not. So a question. You, some you, teenagers went and, go ahead, me and some teenagers went and bought a school and we just bought a school bus simply from going out and doing work. We decided to go fix our own communities. I'm not expecting anything from no politician. I'm not expecting nothing from Donald Trump, Joe Biden, or nobody. We're going to go do it for ourselves. And that's what I believe we need to be doing. I can vote, sure, but nothing's going to change in our community. So you went to, so you went to the juvenile court system. Mm -hmm. Is that not government? Absolutely. So when you say purchased a school, and this school is going to be what private school, charter school, what kind of school yeah. is it going to be? No, it will be independently owned. This will not be funded by the government. No, no, that's why I asked you. So it's going to be a private school. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be a boarding school. A boarding school, uh, and then. For the folks to be able to afford to send their kids to the boarding school, uh, mm -hmm. are, what kind of mechanisms are they using in Georgia? Their own funds? Are they using uh, uh, school vouchers? What are they using? I can't hear you say that again for me. I, said, up. I said, what mechanism are they using to send their kids there to pay for the school? Their own money or are they utilizing vouchers from uh, the Georgia, uh, uh, Georgia government? Absolutely. So for our school, uh, we're financed completely by donors. Uh, we have many donors that have given yearly endowments to our school that will be able to pay for these students to come to our school for free. Many people believe in our mission, and we're making sure that young black men, where we live, where we don't have any rehab programs for uh, juvenile offenders to even get out of jail and stay out of jail. We have people that believe in our mission that are trying to send children to the Expo Boys for free. We have many people that are trying to send kids to this boarding school to be able to take care of themselves. That's what I mean by doing for self. We got to simply get up and do it. So, you're, so you don't, so you don't believe you don't believe that government government policymakers play any role whatsoever in being able to impact the lives of black boys and others in Georgia. If we take them out of that government system, we don't have to worry about that. I keep saying how, how, how is that? So no, hold on, hold on. So here's the question. Uh, no, no, here, no, no, hold on, hold up. No, hold up. Here's the question. Mm -hmm. How do you remove someone out of a government system when we all live in government systems? Okay, being literal. Absolutely, we all live in a government system. Absolutely. However, you can do things to take your to remove mo most government from your life. How? As far as trying to get yourself out of food stamps, How? trying to get yourself out of welfare. You got to go work. You got to get jobs. You got to get out here and go and do it. Despite the interview with Roland Martin's confrontational rhetoric, there has been coverage of the positive impact he's made in his community when he spoke with Lawrence Jones for Fox News. And hopefully, his example can inspire a domino effect throughout the country. Showing the power of positive influence, that's the mission of one impressive young man from Georgia. King Randall started his organization, the X for Boys, in 2019 in an effort to reform the minds of young men and steer them away from a life of crime. Now the group has undertaken a new project, buying 40 acres of land in Albany, Georgia, to build a charter school. Joining me now is King Randall. Uh, obviously, I'm so proud of you for all that you're doing. You said in your video... A lot of people are waiting for the 40 acres. You decided just to go take it. Absolutely. I decided to go take it because I want to eradicate all the excuses that our so-called black leaders have used to dupe our people into thinking that we can't go do for self in our communities. I believe that our children need to see possible, especially where we live in the city of Albany. Our children don't get to see possible. So we decided, well, I decided to go start an organization at the age of 19 to show other young men that you could actually go do something for yourself in your community and not have to wait on anybody to do it for you. A modern day Booker T. Washington is what I call you. Um, yes, sir. <laughs> a lot of people talk about, you know, doing the work in the community, what we should do. But you're in the community teaching these young men uh, these values, conservative values. This is something that you grew up with. 
Absolutely. Um, I had many male figures in my life, my grandfather, my former stepfather, many men around the neighborhood. And a lot of people are always asking, well, King, how are you 21 and you know all of these things? Or you're 21, you shouldn't know this, that, and the third. And I'm just telling them, well, if you have male figures in your life, you'll learn these things quite early. And it shouldn't be surprising. But I understand that it's surprising because we have a lack of father figures um, in our neighborhoods, especially where I live, um, considering that uh, over 90% of the children that I work with don't have any fathers. Um, and they're having trouble reading. They're having trouble in school. They're having trouble with their discipline, etc. until they come into the program. I've worked with children from the juvenile court system. Our program has a 0% recidivism rate. Every child that's come to our program from jail has never been back. And that's coming from a program that I've been running out of my house since 2019. And we're just now getting to a point where we're about to have our own school that we're planning to open this fall. And we just purchased 40 acres of land to teach our children wilderness training, to teach them firearms training, to teach them how to grow their own food, and to also open a fresh food market on that side of town because that side of town has no grocery store. We didn't ask a politician to do it for us. We didn't ask anybody to come and help us do it. We decided to go do it for ourselves. So let me ask you, King, have you had any support from conservatives, Republicans on this message? Because that's what needs to happen. When you find someone that does the job when you don't do it, you would think they would be supporting you, right? Absolutely. And what's interesting is uh, we begin support from all sides um, because you can't about. you can't not love the message. Um, and that's from every side, the left, the right, et cetera. Nobody cannot love the message. Um, we've been invited to speak on many different platforms from the left to the right um, because people are intrigued by the message. And people are actually asking now, instead of, you know, listening to what the media has to say about conservatives, people are asking, what, is, what does conservatism mean? Because you actually seem like you love the black community because they'll make it seem as if black, conservatives don't love the black community. And I'm just like, we do love the black community and we are out here working trying to actually help our communities but they won't show you that on TV so I decided to go show people that we can go do it yeah. and eradicate all the excuses that our leaders have given us and telling us that all we have to do is go vote That's and right. vote for these same people that are not doing anything for our communities but instead of going and doing it for ourselves yeah. so I want to make sure that we are eradicating all of those excuses that they've given us and told us and duped us and into you, believing that we can't do anything and you're doing it King and you know my motto everybody grinds everybody eats and you're grinding and our community is eating. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. He's the man. Chapter 7. Creating Hate The red propagandists distort the facts concerning all racial differences for ulterior motives. All the right is not on the Negro side. Neither is all the wrong. The same holds true in regard to the white man's side. The repository of good or evil is not to be found in any particular race. Black men are just as good or as bad as white men. Yellow men are just as good or bad as brown or red. It ill behooves anyone to speak about the other. White men sold white men as slaves. Black men sold black men as slaves. Black rulers are no more humane than yellow, red, or white rulers. Neither are they less brutal. The placing of the repository of everything right and just among the darker races is a dastardly communist trick to use race as a means of grabbing and enslaving the whole of humanity. Moscow's Negro tools in the incitement of racial warfare place all the ills of the Negro at the door of the white leaders of America. Capitalism and imperialism are made symbols of oppressive white rule in keeping with instructions from the Kremlin. To one familiar with red trickery, it is obvious that placing the blame for all the Negroes' ills at the doors of the white leaders in America is to remove all responsibility from the Negro. This tends to make the Negro a. feel sorry for himself, b. blame others for his failures, c. ignore the countless opportunities around him, d. jealous of the progress of other racial and national groups, e. expect the white man to do everything for him, f. Look for easy and quick solutions as a substitute for the harsh realities of the competitive struggle to get ahead. The result is a persecution complex, a warped belief of the white man's prejudices, the white man's system, the white man's government is responsible for everything. Such a belief is the way the Reds plan it. For the next logical step is hate that can be used by the Reds to accomplish their ends. In their campaign against the white leaders in America, the Reds are careful to point out that this does not apply to the white leaders of Russia and their counterparts in America. This creates the illusion that the white communists are different, that they are the friends and champions of the Negroes. This is the same sucker bait the Reds used to win and use millions of white peoples now under the whiplash of Soviet tyranny. They took the Soviet road to freedom only to find it a snare and a delusion.
The fact that the Reds have never contributed anything tangible to the progress of the Negro is overlooked, though the Reds have collected millions of dollars as a result of race incitement. Like the Communist Party, the NAACP has collected millions of dollars through exploitation of race issues. The bigger the race issue, the bigger the appeal, and the bigger the contributions. Last year, according to Roy Wilkins, the NAACP had the greatest financial year in its history. Yet, one cannot find any report of any of this money being spent for factories and shops to provide jobs, land and home construction, specialized training for talented youth, hospitals, convalescent homes, classes in sanitation and personal hygiene, care and upkeep of property, combating crime and juvenile delinquency, centers to aid Negro youth in preparing to meet stiff employment competition in science and industry. It is then no accident that the NAACP is dubbed the National Association for the Agitation of Colored People. The record speaks for itself. Millions for agitation, not one cent for those things that win the respect and acclaim of other races and national groups. The NAACP set up the situation that erupted into racial violence at Little Rock, Arkansas. Reds all over the world dramatized the racial incidents created in Little Rock as examples of how white Americans resort to extremes of racial violence to deny Negroes an education. Every communist party in Asia and Africa, it seems, was alerted to do a job on America. At the same time, here at home, they were screaming about the damage to our prestige abroad. Any way you look at it, it is a two-way pincer movement against Uncle Sam. Therefore, we may readily assume that any damage done to our prestige abroad should be at the feet of the NAACP and the Reds who started the trouble. What is significant is that those who spread the lie that violence erupted because Negro children are denied an education have not repudiated it. Any confusion or misunderstanding created abroad has not been cleared up by the NAACP leadership. At no time have they admitted that no Negro in the United States is denied an education. And two, they have not admitted that not every Negro wants an education, for reasons better known to himself. That accounts for many Negroes not being able to read or write. Moreover, there are free schools open both day and night for those who want an education. There are Negro institutions of higher learning and integrated ones based upon geographical lines that make available the highest type of training for those Negroes who seek it. There are special scholarships and funds created by white philanthropists that enable Negroes to attend the finest universities and colleges in the country. What is ironic is that most of the Negro leaders responsible for the incitement of racial violence have been the recipients of the scholarships and grants. They possibly would have been cotton pickers or boot blacks were it not for this aid. Because only this aid gave them the free time to plot the destruction of America. One can very well question the sincerity of the Reds and the NAACP when they try to create the impression that America in general, and the South in particular, is a hellhole of despotism where the Negro is concerned. This is so since the whole issue boils down to taking Negro children out of one school and transferring them to another, so that they can be seated with white children on the assumption that only in this way will the Negro child get an education. What is really being implied is that the 113,000 Negro teachers in southern schools are inferior, incompetent, and unable to properly teach the children of their own race. Since it is no longer made a question of better schools, better facilities, and equal pay, it is a question of liquidation of the Negro school and the Negro teacher under the guise of integration. Naturally, White parents are going to resist any attempt to force them to send their children to a school on an integrated basis when Negro teachers are considered unfit by members of their own race. Maybe this is the reason why hundreds of Negro teachers were fired in the border and southern states where there was token integration. It is also implied that a Negro child is handicapped in his studies unless he is sitting beside a white child. What could be more nonsensical or ridiculous? It is a sad commentary on the ability of the Negro child to say that he cannot properly study, or that he will develop harmful complexes if he does not sit beside a white child. By what quirk of reasoning does one conclude that sitting beside a white child will help a Negro child make the grade? Experience shows that a student's success is determined by how much attention, time, and effort he is willing to put into his studies. In New York, for example, many Negro junior high and high school graduates are outrageously poor in spelling, writing, reading, and mathematics, yet they attend integrated schools. 
Even the report of the Public Education Association in 1955 admitted that Southern Negro children moving to New York City are on a level two grades higher than those in New York City schools. What is also important to remember is that the late Dr. George W. Carver, the outstanding Negro scientist, was born of slave parentage. He did not learn to read or write until he was 20. He worked his way through school to become one of the world's greatest scientists. He didn't even have the opportunities of young Negroes today. Every difficulty was a challenge, so he had no time to develop complexes. The main danger and handicap to the Negro is not the Southern school, but the persecution and hate complex the NAACP and the Reds are trying to create. And then, finally, Robert Williams says this. Any all-out minority revolution must create a state of crisis wherein almost all of the male population would be forced to remain in their homes to protect their property and families. The middle class is very large, but it is not accustomed to deprivation and terror. Because of its affluence, it has waxed soft. It has no stomach for massive fire, blood, and violence. The motive force behind its life drive is its endless pursuit of prestige, conspicuous consumption, and sensual pleasure. A few years of violent, sporadic, and highly destructive uprisings will set the stage for the grand finale. After the stage is properly set through protracted struggle, America could be brought to her knees in 90 days of highly organized, fierce fighting, sabotage, and massive firestorm. Ladies and gentlemen, the plans and preparations for a communist revolution of force and violence are far advanced. The organization behind these preparations has almost unlimited financial resources and it provides both training and leadership based upon years of experience in many other countries. Our enemies are deadly serious about their task and it's nothing short of national suicide for us to continue to ignore their plans and their progress. The violent revolution becomes of primary value to the communists to the extent to which it can be used to condition the masses psychologically to accept the nonviolent revolution, which is offered supposedly as the only alternative. Hoping to avoid further violence and bloodshed, the public is to be pressured into accepting measures that will move the country gradually and legally toward communism, but without calling it that. The strategy of the proletarian revolution calls for the quiet conversion of our government into a communist regime, but under the banner of socialism. I want to be clear in how I characterize this. This is a, mostly a protest. Uh, it, is not, uh, it is not, generally speaking, unruly. That ain't a riot, what we're seeing right now in Minneapolis. They are strictly principled anti-fascists, and they've taken a principled stand to stand against white supremacists and white nationalists wherever they may show up. I argue to you tonight, all punches are not equal morally it says it right in the name antifa anti-fascism which is what they were there um fighting listen there's you know no organization is perfect there was some violence any reasonable person would say we shouldn't be destroying other people's property but these are not reasonable times but thank goodness for the looters man and please show me where it says that protests are supposed to be polite and peaceful i don't care that much about statues by a, respectfully should that be done by a commission or the city council not a mob in the middle of the night throwing it into the harbor people will do what they do what you're seeing behind me is one of multiple locations that have been burning in kenosha wisconsin do not get it twisted and think that oh this is some something that has not never happened before and then this is so terrible and where are we and these savages and all of that this is how this country was started people get mad and people get sick of it. People are risking COVID to explain to this country that we're fed up. Most of the major movements in American history have started at the grassroots level and at some point have turned into direct conflict with American government. So remember your history before you judge your present. Thuggishness is thuggishness wherever it comes from politically and we should be the first to call it out. I disagree. <laughs> Building anything is a lot harder than destroying it.
The leftists in America are consistent with indoctrinating minority communities with the idea that America is the worst place in the world for them, that they are hated by white people. Despite the historical progress we have made as a country in building this multicultural nation, it's easy to destroy race relations when all you do is repeatedly misrepresent the races to each other. Over the last century, Legacy media and left-wing activists will highlight any race interaction that is confrontational, make it viral, and tell everyone that this is how it is everywhere in the country. Many fake hate crimes go viral, and people are quick to believe the rhetoric and propaganda. Repeat this method of creating hate, and you can destroy a nation within a few decades. The left-wing activists will also make millions of dollars setting up funding campaigns to improve the lives of minorities, only for the money to never appear anywhere in these destroyed minority communities. All the money, it seems, goes to funding more incitement through propaganda. No reasonable solutions are ever presented. Just like the NAACP was dubbed the National Association for the Agitation of Colored People. BLM has been dubbed burn, loot, and murder when the riots and looting became acceptable after George Floyd's death. As both of these organizations have done nothing but increased funding through public and private contributions in the millions of dollars, only to continue to perpetuate division, animosity, conflict, and hate. Ayan Hirsi Ali expands on the current state of the war against the Western world. So... Radical Islam and terrorist attacks that take place or that are plotted are unfolding in a context within Western society where there is a great deal of moral relativism. Uh, we're in the midst of these culture wars where uh, on one side identity politics prevails and according to the dictates of identity politics, multiculturalism, moral relativism, the West is held responsible for past sins from slavery to colonialism to the Holocaust and the story of Western civilization is told only from that perspective. Just a series of terrible things heinous offenses against humanity that Western civilization committed. The other side of the story, all the good things that the West has done, that is not told or it is suppressed. And in that context, it becomes, you know, you open the door for exploitation and the radical Islamists who are pushing their political agenda through peaceful means called da'wah or through violence called jihad, they exploit that opening. And by the way, it's not just the radical Islamists. Uh, both China and Russia and other adversaries are happy to exploit that sort of thing. I don't think that radical Islamic doctrine or its agenda is capable of defeating Western society. It's just militarily, economically not capable of doing that. But if the West implodes, that's going to come from the inside. We don't challenge where these two movements, these two ideologies, where they part ways. So they have a lot of things in common. The identitarians, these days we call them woke. Um, so the woke despise anyone who disagrees with them. They're committed to their orthodoxy. They use that same playbook of smearing people's characters, committing character assassination and doing anything they can absolutely to shut down debate. And their political agenda in many ways is similar to that of the radical Islamists because they want to bring the house down. They complain that there is a structural racism and structural injustice. And the only way to correct those injustices is by bringing down the master's house. And that is a commitment that they share with the radical Islamists. So you can see where they come together and work together. But very few people have taken the opportunity to actually challenge them on those issues because radical Islamists, as you know, see women as inferior. I don't think they've even recognized that there's such a thing as uh, transgender. Uh, and then in many Muslim countries, and according to radical Islamists, uh, homosexuals, LGBT people, uh, actually, that's a capital offense and they should be killed or imprisoned. And so no one has really taken them, the Islamists and uh, the identity politics people, and put them in a place that makes it very clear to them, those two groups, that there is some things they have in common, but there are some pretty major things that they don't. I've seen a few incidents, for instance, in the United Kingdom, in some elementary or high school situations where sex education is recommended or demanded by these schools, and then the Islamists come in and shut that down, or where they try to make a case for tolerance towards LGBT communities, and the Islamists come down, they come and they shut that down. So I, I've seen incidents like that. And obviously, I think you're familiar with the history of Iran 
where a leftist movement was very happy with overthrowing the Shah, but they didn't expect the Islamists to take control. And when the Islamists took control of government, they obviously suppressed and shut down the leftists, threw them in prison and executed them. And so for the moment, I think in that relationship or so-called alliance between the far left and the Islamists, the Islamists see the far left as useful idiots, which they are and have been for a long time. The media today is just as rotten as during Johnson's era. They only cover stories that will fit their biased view of race in America. When a hate crime is revealed as a hoax, the media will not give it the same coverage as when it was first believed to be a real incident. Recently, a content creator under the moniker Gothics made a video on the recent social media campaign Hashtag Stop Asian Hate, along with the manipulation and misdirection of emotions manufactured by legacy media organizations to continue building false narratives about racism. As I mentioned in my first video, it's not a secret that racism is a hot topic. So hot that many people depend on keeping racism alive to earn a living or to achieve power. Of course, they are not going to tell you this for obvious reasons, but I assure you that these folks do not give a damn about you. Hi, my name is Gothics, and today we're discussing Stop Asian Hate because, well, the media tells us we should be focused on this, just like they do when they tell us to focus on any other story when they frame their coverage to support a narrative that they want to push, just as they did with George Floyd or generally any incident that involves a black victim and a white suspect. Going back to my original question, I asked you which of these names seemed familiar. If you were outraged about George Floyd, then you should be equally outraged to learn about Tony Timpa, a 32-year-old man who died by the hands of police officers. Did I mention that the officers were also kneeling on him? But if you look at the coverage surrounding Tony Timpa, it's clear that the story wasn't treated in the same way as the coverage surrounding George Floyd. Race isn't mentioned anywhere in the story, and of course, Tony's death didn't spark international outrage. In case you haven't figured it out yet, race hustlers are not specific to black issues. There was recently a mass shooting in Georgia, and we can see how quickly the media labeled this incident as a hate crime fueled by white supremacy. But if you learned anything in my original video, then you should know that the media's job is to report the news, and they're not in charge of homicide investigations. So why would the media outlets try to link this case to racism, even though it was determined that the motive behind the incident was due to a sexual addiction? And regardless of how disgusting that is to hear, a sexual addiction is very different from targeting someone specifically because of their race. And before you accuse me of creating more division by pointing out facts that are easily accessible to the public, let me be clear that lying and deliberately spreading propaganda actually creates more division. And if we compare the news coverage surrounding violence against Asians as we did in my previous video for violence against blacks, once again, we can see a trend. 84-year-old killed after a horrific daytime attack caught on video in San Francisco. Hmm, interesting. No mention of the suspect's race. All right, let's move on. Three arrested in beating and robbery of Asian man in San Francisco laundromat. No mention of the suspect's race. Suspect arrested for brutally attacking two Asian men in San Francisco. Oh, and big surprise, no mention of suspect's race. But what's interesting about this is the second the media catches wind of a white offender or someone that can at least pass as white for committing a crime against a person of color, rest assured, you'll know what the suspect looks like. And if we consider all the anti-white rhetoric that's been brewing through entertainment, education, and diversity training, it's very clear what agenda is being pushed. Because if the media overlords truly cared about fighting racism, then they wouldn't cherry pick which cases they report as hate crimes depending on what color the suspects are. Guys, I'm being serious right now. If you're a critic of my videos and you find my content to be white supremacist talking points, seek help immediately. Take your feelings off the table and actively listen to what I'm saying. You are being manipulated. Make no mistake, this divide that we're seeing in America is deliberate and it's fueled in part by the media. And if you still think I'm full of shit, try this out for an experiment. 
The next time a story is reported, pay attention to how the coverage is framed. What circumstances do they mention race? Are they labeling something a hate crime long before a formal investigation has been completed? Is there evidence that contradicts the narrative that's being pushed, like the data I showed you at the beginning of this video? And most importantly, pay attention to which media outlets constantly race bait their articles. Do they lean more on the right or the left? or both. I already know the answers to all of these questions, but I'm not going to tell you. You know why? Because as I said earlier, I don't believe in making things easier for people. You can research, you got fingers, you got a brain. Now go ahead and use it. Knowledge is power. Share these recordings of history with people you know, and people who need to know. Thanks for tuning in. And if you like my work, please consider supporting my series and buying a deck of cards from my store, La Lotaria Loca. The people that run this country have no allegiance to this country, people. They have allegiance to the bank. These people don't care about the country. They destroy countries for fun. Why? It destroys the middle class, which is what Karl Marx wanted creates a large lower class. And what does a large lower class do? They become obedient. I'm not joking around when I throw around that term slavery. It might not come back around like you saw it back in the day. It'll just be a modern form. You see, what they realized was if you can make the slave comfortable, it's easier to keep them docile and, and, and obedient. And that's what they've done this year, well, last year. And still this year, they've, they've figured out, oh, these people are comfortable. They're never going to book against the system. We can make them do whatever we want to do. We'll shut down their business. Meanwhile, Walmart, Target, Amazon, all these Whole Foods, all these large corporations get to stay open. But you couldn't, America. Why? Because the commies run this country and they have no allegiance to it. They want to destroy the middle class. They want a slave class and they want them and they want to rule over us like cattle. Chapter 8. Modern Day Carpetbaggers at the root of all the present racial trouble is interference in the internal affairs of southern states by people not at all interested in the amicable settlements of any problems arising between Negro and white Americans. This interference comes from organizations and individuals in the North seeking to use the Negro. Among them are found communists, crypto-communists, fuzzy-headed liberals, eggheads, pacifists, idealists, civil disobedience, advocates, socialists, do-gooders, conniving politicians, self-seekers, muddle-headed humanitarians, adult-brained intellectuals, crackpots, and plain meddlers. Like missionaries, they descend on the South ostensibly to change or alter it to benefit the Negro. In fact, and in implication, all of them seek to bypass the responsible white and Negro leaders in the South to effect a solution. They employ a pattern of setting up provocative situations which inflame and agitate the white populace, and then using it as propaganda here and abroad against the South in particular, and all of America in general. White Southerners who oppose these missionaries are pronounced upon and labeled race baiters, reactionaries, Ku Kluxers, white supremacists, persons outside of the law, and so forth. Negro Southerners who oppose these missionaries are also attacked and labeled Uncle Toms, traitors of the race, handkerchief heads, white folk niggers, and so forth. Obviously, such name-calling is a deliberate attempt on the part of these missionaries to scuttle all the progress made by the Negroes since slavery by creating an atmosphere of distrust, fear, and hate. Like a witch, steering her brew, the missionaries stir up all the sectional and racial bitterness that arose in the wake of the Civil War and Reconstruction. They open old wounds, they thumb the pages of closed chapters, they rake over the dying embers of old grudges, old grievances, old fears, and old hates that time has been gradually consigning to history in the onward sweep of a young, lusty, healthy, and growing nation. Labeling opponents as a speciality of the Reds, Smear as a cardinal technique. Any label found in the red stockpile, you may be sure, is carefully made and selected to draw the maximum hate to the person or persons of the group or organization to which it is attached. The use of such labels has a tendency to divide America. Nothing, in my opinion, would please the aforementioned wired assortment of missionaries more than a divided America unless it is a Soviet America. They are forever predicting it at the same time working tirelessly to bring it about. 
Moreover, while they talk about racial strife in America as providing grist for Moscow's propaganda mill, they are busy creating it. They are careful to hide the fact that they are responsible for the provocations of extremists as was the case in Little Rock. In all red propaganda here and abroad, such acts of extremists are made the symbol of the treatment of the Negro in America. It is also a red smear pot in which all opponents of the forwith solution of the race problem are tossed. The fact is that the majority of white southerners are opposed to extremists. All white southern juries have convicted some of them as troublemakers and white southern judges have sentenced some of them to long prison terms. This is deliberately ignored or played down by the leftists. James P. Mitchell, Secretary of Labor, reported that the Department of Labor in a recent survey found that purchasing power of the Negroes was more than $17 billion and that a third of the Negro population owned their homes. Negro wage earners, he said, make four and a half times what they earned in 1940. He listed important gains by Negroes in ownership of banks, insurance companies, businesses, civil service employment, and professional, skilled crafts and clerical and sales fields. In education, he said, Negro college enrollments have increased at a rate six times that of white students, while more than 98% of Negroes between the age of 7 and 13 are in school. These facts, too, are ignored or played down by the leftist missionaries and irresponsible crusaders. And political warfare, it seems, a cardinal principle to credit your enemy with only that which will hasten the buildup for his destruction. The media of public information is far from free of communists and fellow travelers who operate under the guise of liberalism. They are ready at all times to do an effective smear job. Among these red tools may be found editorial writers, columnists, news commentators, and analysts in the press, radio, and television. They go overboard in giving top news coverage to racial incidents fomented by the leftists and also those incidents that are interpreted so as to show biased attitudes of whites against Negroes. This is a propaganda hoax aimed not at helping the Negro, but casting America in a bad light in order to destroy its prestige and influence abroad, thereby aiding Soviet Russia in the penetration and conquest of Asia and Africa. In the meantime, the Negro is a sacrificial lamb, the innocent victim of the widespread racial hate which the leftists are creating. The energizing of race hate is an asset to the red cause. The more, the merrier. So long as it erupts in cross burnings, threats, loss of jobs, refusal of loans, boycotts, bombings, fistfights, beatings, and shootings. Thus, all progress based upon understanding, goodwill, friendship, and mutual cooperation built up painfully over the years is wiped out. White Americans are set against Negro Americans and vice versa. The stage is thus set for the opening of a dark and bloody era in Negro and white relations. Many white northern politicians objectively aid the rapidly deteriorating racial situation through the exploitation of leftist propaganda to garner Negro votes. They care not a tinker's damn about the southern Negro and simply flatter the northern Negro whom they consider a gullible fool. Getting elected and re-elected is their only concern. Dishonorable mention should also be given to those white individuals and racial groups posing as friends of the Negro, only to use him as a spearhead to attain certain objectives. They constitute in no small way the financial sinews of the movement. Naturally, they project programs and policies on those Negro tools who live off of their legacy. Since he who pays the piper calls the tune, could anything less than full submission be expected by those so-called Negro leaders? It does not matter to what extent Negro Americans generally feel the brunt of the racial hostility which these harmful programs engender. So long as the so-called Negro leaders win the approbation of their white masters and the money keeps rolling in. Significantly, among all the aforementioned groups and individuals, there is only one highly organized, trained, and disciplined force, and that is the Communists. So they are able to use, manipulate, and combine this weird assortment of leftist missionaries in one way or another to bring about a social upheaval which will plow up southern institutions to their roots. Indeed, the spectra of the modern carpetbaggers haunts the South. Reds, NAACPers, do-gooders, and other missionaries follow in the footsteps of those northerners who for narrow, selfish, personal, or political reasons meddled in the affairs of the South in the period immediately following the Civil War. Like their predecessors, these modern-day carpetbaggers create only mischief for they have no true interest in the South. 
A check of the record for these modern-day carpetbaggers will show that most of them are either communists or persons who have been or are now associated with the communists' cause as a fronter, endorser, or fellow traveler. Under the circumstances, it becomes the bounden duty of every government agency in the interest of internal security to reveal to the American people the record of each individual, regardless of race, creed, religion, position, or rank, who is involved in inciting white and Negro Americans against each other. Naturally, the opponents of the publication of such information are going to scream louder than 10,000 pigs caught under a fence. Charges of anti-Negro, anti-democratic bias will fill the air. Old Man Smear will have a field day. In this way, as in the past, any real investigation of communism or pro-communism among Negroes is headed off, defeated, or driven into a blind alley. Color and race thus becomes a sanctuary. On the one hand, patriotic and honest politicians and officials do not dare invade it critically without dire consequences to their personal reputations. On the other hand, this same sanctuary becomes the playground, not only of the Reds, but of the hypocrites, demagogues, bigots, self-seekers, opportunists, conniving politicians, and other dregs of human society. Too few Americans in our day have the courage of their convictions. Too few will fly in the face of leftist opposition. Too few will stand up for truth in the face of the ominous and destructive storm of Me Tooism, or the communist ideological regimentation that hangs like a pall over our country. Many take the attitude that it is better to be safe than sorry, or conclude after little difficulty or several reverses that, if you can't beat them, join them. The words God, country, and posterity have lost much of their substance and are becoming only a shadow in the hearts and minds of many Americans. Great Negro Americans such as Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver should leave both as an inspiration and a reminder to the present and successive generations of Negro Americans that they too can make their lives sublime and in departing leave behind them footprints in the sands of time. The great surge of progress of the Negro since slavery can be largely traced to the work and efforts of these two men, their supporters, their emulators, and their followers. Theirs was a deep and abiding pride of race, a firm belief in the ability of their benighted people to rise above their past and eventually stand on an equal plane with all the other races. Moreover, equality was to them not just a catchword, the prattle of fools, but a living thing to be achieved only by demonstrated ability. Carpetbaggers is a term for a political candidate who seeks election in an area where they have no local connections, or a person perceived as an unscrupulous opportunist. The term carpetbaggers seems outdated to me as I have rarely heard it used in the vernacular of my generation, but the behavior remains the same. The tactics of left-wing activists mirrors the historical carpetbaggers playbook. People who are not part of a specified community insert themselves into their personal problems, holding signs and shouting slogans as if they care about the problems of the community. They are only successful in agitating the problem and using the conflict that arises out of it as viral propaganda on social media and legacy legacy media outlets. And similar to Johnson's time, those who oppose the left-wing insurgency are slandered and libeled with names to ruin their reputation. It is not uncommon to get physically attacked if you are outnumbered in the midst of their propaganda tours of street demonstrations. They still use historical conflicts as evidence of existing bigotry, even though none of it applies to the people existing today. To them, all the white people are the center of everything evil that has ever existed. And if you are not white and disagree with the rhetoric, you are perceived to be just as evil as the whites and categorized as some kind of slave to whiteness. This deceptive rhetoric is not considered racist as the leftists have used the Orwellian tactic of changing the meaning of the word, racism being one of them. They claim that power plus privilege is what defines racism. Black people are slaves to the system. Slaves to racism, systematic racism, institutionalized racism, injustice. Shit, I agree with that. They want us dead, my niggas. Who is they? They, my brother, white people. All cops are racist, my niggas. I don't think all cops are racist. Because you're not woke, my brother. If you're a cop, you automatically hate colored people. Even black cops? Yes, even those coons. That don't even make sense. That's because your third eye is closed. The white man got you confused. Wake up, my brother. Know oh, yourself. Oh, Jesus Christ. Exactly. Perfect example. You still believe in a white man's God. You're not woke, bro. 
all white people hate black people. That's not true. You disagreeing with me. If you black and you disagree with another black person, that means you hate black people too. Black lives matter, brother. You not woke. Do research. Get woke. You not woke. You a coon. Don't be a coon. You are black. You're black, brother. Left-wing activists and organizations continue to this day to divide America by misrepresenting race relations, while at the same time working to create situations that validate their worldview. Ayan Hirsi Ali warns of the dangers of critical race theory and the cult it is currently building. Ibram Kendi, Robin DiAngelo, who wrote White Fragility, uh, they are absolutely not interested in debate. They are not interested in discussion. In my view, they are not even interested in ending racism because they refuse to define it. Ibram Kendi goes from refining it as something that affects people to not. It's not about people, he said. It's about policies. And then you have this jump from one to the other. Again, this corruption of language, this circular reasoning. Uh, you are white, therefore you are racist if you say I'm not then you are suffering from white fragility and so round and round we go and that has a cult-like quality to it and it also has a cult-like following to it and if I look at some of the people who are animated by this these are middle class young white people mostly young white people there are not many Hispanics or African Americans or other immigrants from other parts of the world who are drawn to this cult and woke ideology I'm not an expert, I'm not a sociologist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but someone really needs to try and explain why this is the case. Chapter 9. Race Pride is Passé. The Negro businessman has always been a chief target of the Reds. They despise him because of his conservatism. They label him a tool of the white imperialists and an enemy of the Negro masses. Such labels are reserved for those the Reds plan to liquidate since the Negro businessman is an inspiration and example to other Negroes to take advantage of the countless opportunities of the free enterprise system. He is therefore an object of derision by communists. An enthusiastic response of the Negro to the appeal and opportunities for Negro business is a cardinal bulwark against communism. Consequently, the Reds seek to discredit, discourage, and liquidate Negro business. Only during the period of the Popular Front did the Reds cease their attack on Negro business in order to link the Negro banker, broker, realtor, businessman, merchant, lawyer, physician, preacher, worker, and farmer with Bolshevism under the guise of a National Negro Congress. Basically, the Reds' policy is now, and always has been, anti-Negro business. The fact that Negro business is sustained in the main by Negro patronage, that it exists almost entirely in the Negro community, makes it vulnerable to attacks by the Reds. They term it a product of segregation, social isolation, the ghetto, etc. And to the Reds use the example of sharp competition between small and big business to discourage Negro entry into the general arena. While it is true that Negro businesses in only a few instances function outside of the Negro community, this does not mean that they cannot function in other areas if the Negro provides attractive goods or services. But what is wrong with the Negro owning and operating community business? The Germans, the Italians, the Irish, the Jews, the Chinese have their respective communities where they own and operate most of the businesses. At no point in time do they consider it as a crime. Chinatown in New York and San Francisco are splendid examples of the community resourcefulness and pride that draw, like a magnet, multitudes from all walks of life. The Negro can learn much from the Chinese. I recently attended a luncheon at the Hotel New Yorker in New York City, sponsored by a very fine and cultured group of Negro ladies. We were served in a private dining room by white waiters and waitresses. There was not a single white person present except the hotel employees. Yet these Negroes considered this integration. Any one of a number of Negro charters could have supplied the same service. What is more important is that a large sum paid to this hotel could have helped develop and expand a Negro catering service. Other races have such services which are not considered integrated. Yet the Negro bitten by the integration bug is so naive that he thinks that boycotting his own race and spending his money in a place where he is unwanted and isolated is putting his own best foot forward. One of the officers of the group said, It's good to be seen in such places, as if some special honor had been conferred upon her. 
She was so carried away with the fact that she could walk through the lobby of a white hotel to a private, segregated dining room that had I suggested that it did not mean acceptance, I would have made an enemy. Other members waxed eloquent in their praise of those responsible for the decision to hold our annual luncheon in white hotels because it leads towards integration. How I'll never understand. Nobody paid any attention to our coming. They had seen Negroes before. We were not too hard to be seen nor identified. We left the same way. There was no welcome mat, no enthusiastic reception. To me, it seemed that the employees and management were glad to get rid of us. The disastrous effect of integration, so ardently advocated by the Reds and the NAACP, is evident in the following article. Negro Businessmen Disturbed Negro businessmen, such as hotel owners, tavern operators, and sellers of cooked food, are up in the air in some cities because Negro money is bypassing their cash registers and falling into the pockets of white proprietors who run choice spots in downtown areas. This is especially true in the convention cities of Detroit and Miami. Detroit businessmen on the Negro side raised quite a howl a few months back when all Negro female conclave hit town and none of the delegates as much as looked through the doors of Negro-operated businesses. They slept in white-owned hotels, conveyed in white convention rooms, ate in white dining rooms, drank at white bars, and danced in white ballrooms. Owners and operators of Negro businesses in Miami, Florida were quite angry last year after the African Methodist Episcopal Church General Conference packed up and got out of town. They claimed AME delegates, and there were hundreds of them, spent their money with white hotels on Miami Beach and even took their meals in Miami Beach restaurants. Negro taxicab drivers were pretty hot too. Not too far back, Negro cab drivers chased a white cab driver out of Miami's Negro area because he was riding a Negro passenger. Somebody down in Miami must have talked to officials of the Church of God in Christ before they held their International Youth Congress there last week. Because the conference was held in a Negro church, delegates lived in Negro hotels, ate in colored dining rooms, and held their banquets in big rooms made available by Negro hotels. They even held an open-air festival at the all-Negro Virginia Beach just out of Miami. Betrayal of the Negro people may well come through communist corruption of the Negro intellectual. This is not so difficult since the communists, the white liberals, and the white progressives do the thinking for most of them. The utter bankruptcy of the Negro intelligentsia is startlingly evident by reason of the absence of any strong and dramatic movement for genuine Negro organization leadership and thinking. Deep in the swap of inferiority, lack of ability, muddled thought, the Negro intelligentsia looks to the phony white liberals, politicians, and progressive hypocrites for leadership, guidance, and money. These whites are carriers of isms other than Americanism, which spreads like an epidemic in the ranks of the hapless Negro intellectuals. Due to the lack of race pride, there is no immunity. Black America. You want black people to succeed but will encourage victimhood over perseverance. You don't want to be viewed as a criminal, but will gladly turn one into a martyr. You say black folks are not a monolith, yet you'll ostracize those who don't think like you, vote like you, or live their life like you. You say you want diversity and representation, but are intolerant to political diversity and political representation. You say black lives matter, but what you really mean is only the black lives who agree with me matter. You say listen to black voices, but only if those black voices vote Democrat. You'll declare that celebrities like Ice Cube and Lil Wayne are being used as political pawns, yet Cardi B and Offset are not. Speaking about Cardi B, she makes a song about wet and that's considered female empowerment, yet Candace Owens, who preaches self-accountability, makes her a sellout. You're fed up with the harmful stereotypes that black Americans have yet refuse to acknowledge how much of a role you've had in creating those same stereotypes. Your music encourages gang violence and drug use. Your media makes a mockery of black people for the sake of entertainment. Your vocabulary is self-deprecating instead of empowering. Your mindset on what is black discourages growth by guilting those who refuse to be boxed in. You say you want racism to end, but will openly be racist towards others because you've convinced yourself that your circumstances give you a free pass to do so. You talk about black empowerment, but will use difference of opinion to justify calling another black person a coon or a house nigger. You talk about setting black people up for success, but will lower the bar with affirmative action. You talk about being kings and queens, 
but will push for bullshit programs like critical race theory that reaffirms white people will always have an advantage over you, thus crippling your self-confidence, destroying your self-worth, and brainwashing black youth to believe that there will always be a cap on their success. How can anyone persevere in this type of environment? You say black people are being exterminated, but refuse to acknowledge the astronomical rates at which black men are killing each other. You would rather focus on how an officer reacted rather than the choices someone made to put themselves in that position to begin with. Instead of encouraging self-ownership, you make excuses for every aspect of someone's life. Blacks are poor, have less resources, or lack the education to succeed, you say but you'll completely discredit the many black immigrants who continue to succeed in this country despite having less favorable circumstances than you. Is racism truly the driving force behind inequality? Or is it the lack of self-ownership, the lack of resilience, and the lack of perseverance? The world is a terrible place, and we both know that racism is never going away. But is adopting victimhood really the solution to all of life's problems? I know that I'll be accused of having self-hatred or being anti-black because I'm pointing out the flaws within our culture. But on the contrary, I believe what I'm saying is a form of love. Anything of value needs to be maintained and maintenance involves addressing the areas that need to be improved. Would you rather someone smile while lying to your face or would you rather hear the truth despite how much it hurts? The first step towards fixing a problem is to acknowledge that there is, in fact, a problem. So, Black America, how do we fix this? The United States seems to be ground zero to suffer from historical guilt of race relations. This narrative is apparent throughout the last century, and then there's people who perpetuate it to profit from it. As G. Edward Griffin stated in an interview, the communists will prod at this weak spot, purposely make it weaker, and use it to destroy our country. In the U.S., particularly for the black community, making every issue race-related is their biggest Achilles heel. Those who point out that making everything a race issue is counterproductive and detrimental are cast out as coons, Uncle Toms, and all the other derogatory names you may have heard. But the communists are responsible for planting the seed of division in the black community for political gain. They never offered any solutions in return, only scripted agitation and organized conflict. Johnson points out how the Chinese communities in New York City and San Francisco are examples of community resourcefulness. Little did he know that during this same time period, in mainland China, they were struggling with their own infiltration by the communist ideology. Now, today, in my generation, the Chinese Communist Party is the biggest threat to the free world and is the leading cause of chaos and conflict through ideological subversion, not only in America, but throughout the world. In conclusion, I believe the difference between my generation and Johnson's is that integration was pressured by the propaganda in his time, and segregation is pressured in my time. I believe that communities built by consent, for example, Chinatown, Koreatown, Little Tokyo, and Little Italy, are all successful because the community decided to build together. In recent history, a black community is working to create something similar in Georgia called Freedom Town. My point is this, people should be allowed to live in their own segregated community should they decide to create a specified community by race, religion, creed, or whatever, by their own consent, even if they're white. Let the people use their own means to live in their own space if they band together to buy land to build a community specifically for them. Johnson goes further into this in chapter 10. Kevin Samuels gives a sharp perspective on the importance of a family hierarchy and how the building block of any country is the family. And this applies to a family structure of any race or ethnicity. So, so we all hear our parents say, yo, when I did something out in the street, Mr. Son Mr. Johnson will whoop my ass and, and take me home. home. And then, get my, and then my parents will whip so, my ass too. Yeah. I, asked, I asked this question to women all the time. All right. Who leads? Who leads? Because if you want the the fundamental building block of any government, I mean, sorry, any country, any state, any community, any society is the family. Is the family, and the and when it gets right down to it, that's a mother and a father. We are different. If you have children, you can sit back and know that you and the, and your the mother of your child have thought different things about that child, but whose word follows? And far too often today, women are leading. 
Because, so it's like, well, if I asked you, how do I get to, uh, how do I get to Bergdorf Goodman? Everybody in here would tell me a different locate, a different route. Mm -hmm. We'd all end up at the same destination. Women are far too worried about their destination being right instead of the, I mean, their route being right instead of the outcome. outcome. Mm. A man's nature is to discipline, correct, structure. A woman's nature is to offer nurture or feelings. So you guess what we get? We've got a generation of softer men and a generation of harder women. They've told their daughters, don't worry about no man, don't worry about you this, get your no education, and such and so forth. And they've told their sons quite the opposite. And then the funny thing is you end up raising the very men that you decry of not being able to lead. Ooh. So when I say who leads, forget every one of the men in this room. Where's the camera? Fuck us. Forget, forget us all. What about your boys? What about your sons? What about your boys? Black boys are reading at the fourth grade level. The next group of leaders are coming from your sons. What are you doing with them? And if you're not, if you have the money to put one of your children to college, is it going to be your son? Are you actually making a differentiation for your son versus your daughters? Because you want your daughters to have somebody that can lead, but you're not teaching any kind of leadership in your home. Yes, uh, they get mad when I start talking no, about no. this because I'm like, okay, you say at in your 30s, all of a sudden you're going to just flip this flip the script and all of a sudden become this cooperative, submissive woman. What history do you have with even cooperating with a man? And I ask a question. Did you, did you have any brothers growing up? Yeah. Did your mother serve your father? Yeah. Did you serve your brothers? What? <laughs> but you go into a Hispanic family and the... I was just about go to Go into a Hispanic family and the girls of the family serve the boys. Now, why is it that a guy who may have come into this country legally or illegally, especially if you're in the South, I make this thing all the time, a guy can come in this country illegally, stand outside a Home Depot or the Day Labor Center and do almost anything, sell oranges, whatever you think for money, but go home and get a submissive, respectful, loyal woman. He ain't got to be a millionaire, but he can get that. But yet, I got to go to Harvard. Mm -hmm. mm. I, 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 Joe's with me often. So I had this conversation with one of our female friends. And she said, demographically, the black woman and the Asian man are the two like falling yeah, I've heard that. groups, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, why? And she said, because the black man has no problem dating outside of his race. <laughs> and the Asian woman has no problem dating outside of her race. And I told her, this girl, she makes a nice amount of money. And I said, yo, because you guys snicker and laugh at the seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year man. Mm. And Maria and Becky will welcome him with open arms. Well, let me tell you, your friend, you're full of shit. <laughs> mm. Ma'am, you are full of shit. Black men, men traditionally are the more racial loyal of any group. That's it. Women are the ones that tend to, because you want to know who dates out the most? Asian women, white men. So the net, net of it is, if black women were as sexually, as desired sexually as black men, do you not think they would date out as often as we would? Oh. But the thing is, the black men we start talking about, they are still saying, I want a woman. With all these situations, modern woman, this or that, still, when we marry, we are marrying a black woman at an 86% rate. But see, they want to talk about the 14% that don't yeah, do it. Yeah, I and, don't like that. I don't and, like that. And, and like if that. you even take it even further, it's really exacerbated when you start getting into things outside of what I consider corporate America. When you start getting into entertainment, athletics, uh, entertainment, athletics, uh, entertainment or athletics, the numbers mm -hmm. are overrepresented. Gotcha. But if you look in where people are making, you know, having to go to work a traditional nine to five day, most people marry people that look like themselves. You see, that's a deflection argument. It is, it is. Because it's at the dismissive. end of the day, all you got, it's like, okay, ma'am, let's accept it. All you got to do is find one. Why can't you find one? And you ask your friend, uh, have you ever been with a man that's suitable or reasonable? And here's where it's going to come. Yeah, back in college, I was engaged once. Well, why didn't that happen? Who broke it off? And I'm going to tell you, almost 100% of the time, they're the ones leaving. You honestly think that these women honestly think that they can leave a man in their 20s and 30s, play the field, do what they want to, and in, in, in their early 20s, and then wait later on in life and get a man that's more valuable as their value is going down. That's what's been marketing to them. But their value, I think you're right. I'm agreeing with you. They think, though, that their value is rising yep. because they are making more money. 
So the things that they value in a man, they think we value in them. And that's one of your biggest arguments. Mm -hmm. Social market. So your money matters not to a man that has his own money. Before well, you before y'all have this exchange really really quickly, as someone who's been married twice, do you want to get married again? I would. I would. I would I would get married again because uh if I decide I want more kids, which that'll be one situation or number two, I, I you're going to have somebody at the end of the life. Word. But the thing is, every woman I deal with, they watch my program. <laughs> they hear exactly what I say. They hear what you and stand for. they know for exactly and they, what I stand exactly. for. And I would tell you this. I don't budge. Because I've done it twice and I realized that I shouldn't have. I don't fault my former relationships for, for not working. Because I grew up the same way we all grew up. We never. I didn't grow up in the position of thinking... That you need to be responsible for everything. You need to have a plan and an outcome. You need to have a place for a woman to nest and not put pressure on them. Pressure is made for shoulders, not for hips. So in the black community, we saw so many women doing stuff that I think many men put undue pressure on a woman that's not really built for the female. So you'll never hear me talk anything uh, negative about my exes. I take 100% responsibility, for, even for the stuff that I could arguably say fell short on their side, not mm -hmm. their responsibility. Lastly, Ayan Hersley Ali states some observations on the Black Lives Matter organization versus the black community and how young Americans would appreciate their country based on experiencing what life is like in another country. I've tried to look at Black Lives Matter as an organization, as a movement. I've been on their website. Just curious, because in the summer we had the killing of George Floyd, a terrible incident. And I go on their website and I don't find anything on that website and in their message that I would say would improve the lives of black people right now. There are things in there such as the abolition of the nuclear family. Now, if you really care about the African-American community, one thing you would not do would be to suggest that the nuclear family be abolished. Because one of the huge problems we have is these absent fathers, teenage pregnancies. There is that type of social blight where the first step would be actually to advocate for the nuclear family. They're advocating for reparations. This is so cosmic and abstract. It's not something that an African-American kid in Texas or in Chicago or in New York is going to feel like that changes my situation right now. They're against charter schools. They're against the police. They want to defund the police. So you have to ask yourself, why is this huge contradiction? If they really, really care about black people, then why are they advocating for all the things that would ruin black families and black communities? The answer is they're not interested in black communities. They're interested in getting to power by exploiting vulnerable communities like blacks, like transgender communities, like women, and so on and so forth. So these are not people, it's not an ideology or a cult that's interested in justice or bringing about justice. It's only for them to get power. And I think if young people growing up in America or in any other Western society, if they feel that their societies are unjust and terrible places to live in, I think the best program would be for them to spend some time in other countries where life is different. So some of the women who say, oh my gosh, it's terrible to be a woman in the United States, I would say spend a few months in Afghanistan or in any country in the Middle East, try and take some time off and go to various parts of Africa and let's see what you come back with. And then report back. And I think if it were an integrated part of the college curriculum or a gap year after you leave high school, I think people would come back really sober and appreciative of what they have. And, you know, we've got to improve on the situation in America. We have inequality. We have injustices. We have racism. We have all of these problems. None of us are denying that. It's just that, A, the answer is not to destroy the entire framework and the entire structure of American society. And B, there are ways of doing it within the system. There are ways of trying to achieve improvements within the system we have rather than argue and advocate for the complete destruction of what we have. Black History Month you find ridiculous. Why? You're going to relegate my history to a month? Oh, come well, on. What do you do with yours? What, which month is White History Month? No, well, no, 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 come on, tell me. Well, the, I'm Jewish. Okay, which I'm month sorry. is Jewish History Month? Uh, there isn't one. Oh, oh, why not? Yeah. Do you want one? 
No, no. No. I, 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 I don't either. I don't want a Black History Month. Black history is American history. How are we going to get rid of racism? And stop still... talking about it. I'm going to stop calling you a white man. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you to stop calling me a black man. I know you as Mike Wallace. You know me as Morgan Freeman. Chapter 10. Wisdom Needed. All other racial and national groups have their respective organizations. No Negro belongs to any of these organizations, nor is his membership sought or welcome. Moreover, no Negro is called upon to decide what is best for any one of these groups. What is most important is that no one of these groups considers itself segregated because no Negro belongs, is invited, nor has his opinion sought. Yet the Negro intellectual contends that to get together as Negroes, to discuss common problems as Negroes, to decide what is best for Negroes without white participation is segregation. Such an attitude speaks for itself. It is a hangover from slavery when the Negro had to depend on the master for everything necessary for his well-being. At the same time, it proves that no proclamation of emancipation is capable of freeing those who do not wish to be free. The Negro intelligentsia, by far and large, is physically free, but mentally a slave. After nearly a century removed from chattel slavery, they are unwilling and incapable of throwing off their slave psychology. Reds and political charlatans of all shades, aware of this fact, find the Negro intellectual easy prey. Fundamentally, there is deep racial consciousness among Negro Americans. They have, in spite of the divisive influence of the Negro intellectual, the same instinctive urge to group together as have other racial and national groups. They desire progress through the medium of education, reliability, know-how, and productivity, all so essential and competitive society. They know that to hold a comparable job, they must be just as good, and in most instances, better. Though, a number of Negro intellectuals try to convince them that the cry of discrimination is a good substitute. Furthermore, they know that a number of Negroes developed skills during the war, but that the great majority are not highly skilled or trained to fit into industry during this atomic age, thanks to W.E.B. Du Bois and Monroe Trotter, for their indefatigable toil to defeat the industrial training program of Booker T. Washington, which would have made the Negro an indispensable part of American industry. Booker T. Washington's philosophy of education was to prepare the majority of Negroes through vocational training, to play a vital role in the rapidly developing American economy before and after the turn of the century. He undoubtedly saw the process of industrialization, the ensuing demand for trained, qualified personnel, i.e., skilled tradesmen who could be relied upon to do a job efficiently and well. Such training would enable the Negro to maintain his favored position after slavery and place him in a better competitive position against immigrants and the labor market. He stressed pride of race, home ownership, land ownership, along with industrial and agricultural training. Leftists Du Bois and Monroe Trotter bitterly assailed this philosophy. Consequently, most Negro youths avoided skilled trades as menial. According to Mr. Carter G. Woodsum, the vacuum was filled by white immigrant labor. Many Negroes realized that Du Bois was wrong then, as he is today, in his attempt to steer them down the road to communism. Further, the average Negro realizes that his happiness and well-being are not served to him on a silver platter, but come as a result of hard work and difficult struggle. He therefore seeks, one, practical solutions to all his problems, and two, a way to get along with other Americans with the least possible friction. Sagely, he realizes that a man cannot live constantly in the miasmic fog of race hostility without stifling to death, nor can he live fighting all other Americans all the time. On the other hand, the vociferous Negro intellectuals along with the Reds, through their impractical, unrealistic alien behavior, turn race relations into shambles. Every Negro who opposes integration and the NAACP becomes a traitor or an Uncle Tom. Every white person taking a similar stand is branded a criminal and outside of the law. The fact that courts have been known to reverse themselves and that under our system of government, every American has the right to protest and oppose any rule considered onerous or prejudicial is ignored. Stupidly, they go about their business of forcing everybody to conform or be damned, thus building up fires of resentment that would require the work of centuries to extinguish. 
Already, under the guise of struggling for Negro rights, they have created all the explosive material for racial violence by making impossible demands, resisting sane and just decisions, opposing compromise and adjustment, and demanding that everything must be done forthwith or not at all. They have no love for their own people. They have no love for America. Naturally, they get the Kremlin's support and approval. Feeling frustrated and inferior, they run to communism and civil disobedience in their folly. They play Moscow's game, and they deserve whatever red reward that is due them. The most important takeaway from this chapter is applicable to every person who's been watching this series. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, red, yellow, or brown. As long as you seek to learn useful skills and resourceful trades, you can be successful in your endeavors. Immigration also seems to have had continuing consequences for the black community. In Johnson's era, it was white immigrants from Europe. Today, it is the illegal immigrants coming from south of our border. A great nation is not conquered from the outside until the inside has already been corrupted and destroyed within. A quote from Marcus Garvey. We are going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery because whilst others might free the body, none but ourselves can free the mind. Mind is your only ruler, sovereign. The man who is not able to develop and use his mind is bound to be the slave of the other man who uses his mind. When Kevin Samuels was diagnosed with cancer at a young age, it forced him to focus on the fact that we are all here on borrowed time. I, I recently found out you had stage 3 cancer, right? Yeah. Yeah that, yeah, that made me look at things even more. I'm like, man, maybe he he to the point now, like, I don't care about pleasing nobody. Well, I'm going to tell it how it is. Well, when, when I was 21 years old, I was diagnosed with uh, stage 3 Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, and while everybody else was about to go out, graduate from college and go off into live life, I'm looking at my own mortality. So I've always, you know, even though this has one of the highest cure rates, I've always known that we're we're all on borrowed time. Mm. We're all on borrowed time. So I'm like, you know, yeah, through hook or crook, I want to be the best at what I do to try to get the most out of this life that we have because it's not promised to us. Mm. So um, it's not to do it to make it rich or whatever. It's really because I want to have a life that was being worth lived. So. That's actually a really uh, good question and an interesting answer just because that kind of is the thing that you wish that you could give a lot of young people is like, how do I convince you, even though you're 21 and you're just having a good time, how do I convince you to take your life a little bit more serious when I see the potential? And it's interesting that it took something as extreme mm -hmm. as that to make you see how serious your life was, even, and, even and, as a young guy. And the, that whole thing, that what did it wasn't average. What, what really made it stick was dying alone. Mm. And that came from Kotokoshi. Because you've been there. You've heard them talk about it. And we have been, and many women have said, I never looked at it that way, but this is where my aunt or so-and-so is. It's like, if I don't change this, I'm not going to have anybody around me. And that means when I leave, I will leave by myself. And that, that may scare some people, but if that's what it took to get you to do something different, then you need to be scared a little bit. Definitely. So there we go. Well said. Kevin Samuels. <laughs> we shall see what happens with this one. I feel like I this, this episode, I feel like we just changed some lives. There's yeah. definitely people watching this that are going to live their life differently after watching mm -hmm. that, and that is a very good feeling. Ayan Hirsi Ali speaks about the responsibility of preserving liberty. I think the, the saying, you know, that if you want to preserve liberty, it's an eternal struggle. It is something that you have to be aware of all the time. That holds true to this day. And whether a society is secular or not, if a society is free, and if the fundamental principle of that society is based on freedom and on, on liberty, then the assumption is that that eternal vigilance is warranted. I think bad ideas and bad ideologies are just part of being human. We were dealing with radical Islamic ideology and still are to a certain extent. And then comes this woke ideology that is sort of a recycled Marxism or neo-Marxism, which we're familiar with. Is it easier for these ideologies, especially the quasi-religious types of things, to emerge and find a foothold in secular societies? I think the answer to that is true that if you have your own religion, Judaism or Christianity or whatever, you have your own belief community, 
it becomes difficult for other people to seduce you with ideologies that, you know, you think, I've already got a religion, I don't need your religion. Uh, you also, if you, I think, uh, come out of a religious background, as I do, you recognize a religion when you see it. It's, you know, a cult and, and that cultish characteristics of the woke. I think anybody who's grown up in any serious religion can see that this, this is a religious, a quasi-religious uh, thing. But I, I'm very careful because I'm not an expert on this topic, but I do listen to both sides. I want to be very careful that I don't say, oh, the solution to the problem we're having right now is because we've drifted away from religion, we have to go back to religions. I think that's, first of all, not possible, but even if it were possible, I think wokeism and other, by, uh, other bad ideologies will emerge anyway. And so I prefer to go back to that truism that if you want to preserve a liberal society, you do have to do it with vig it's constant vigilance. You just can't get complacent, unfortunately. We have seen a backlash here. I think what led to the election of Donald Trump in 2016 was a backlash against, at the time, I don't remember, we used the word wokeism, but the prevailing phrase was political correctness. So if we feel like we, we can't speak, we can't say what we need to say, and uh, we're called deplorables and looked down upon, uh, then people will vote with their feet. They leave the parties that are calling them these names. One thing that gives me hope is the emergence of podcasts. All of these market-driven ways of exchanging information that established organizations refuse to publish. So instead of me having to call the New York Times all the time, can you please publish this op-ed? Now we're starting our own podcasts. Uh, our own newsletters, we're blogging, we are communicating with one another using the market forces to communicate information and opinion that is censored away from other places. I hope that that, can, that is the true backlash. And I've heard and read about people who are saying maybe podcasts should also be stopped or controlled or restrained or, you know, let's be aware of that and let's push back against that. Freedom needs constant vigilance. It also needs constant protection of the freedom of speech, the freedom to exchange ideas without fear. And here we are. I mean, we are not on any of the big, powerful broadcasting corporations. You've got your own thing, and I've started my own thing, and all the people we know, well, they've started their own thing. And I think there lies, at least in terms of increasing the awareness of problems, I think there we have a solution and a proper backlash. Larry Elder speaks on influential black figures who are not acknowledged by prominent black institutions. Clarence Thomas, of course, I mean, I hope every American knows who Clarence Thomas is. Well, but, well Jan, the reason yeah. a lot of blacks don't know who Clarence Thomas is and don't know who Walter Williams is and don't know who Clarence, who um, uh, Thomas Sowell is, the most prominent publication for blacks historically has been Ebony Magazine. I cannot remember a time when in Ebony Magazine the current issue was not on the coffee table in my parents' house. That's how influential it is, it was. Uh, they had a feature every year called the 100 Most Influential Black Americans. And it would have people in there like MLK and so forth. Uh, because so many blacks became so prominent, they had to upgrade it to the 100 plus most influential black Americans. That's what it is last time I checked. And every year, absent in the list of the 100 most uh, prominent black Americans, absent are Clarence Thomas, absent are Walter Williams, absent are Thomas Sowell. Now, Clarence Thomas is only one of nine members of the Supreme Court. By definition, he's influential, yet he's not in this publication. Uh, Thomas Sowell was described by David Mamet, the playwright, as America's most important contemporary philosopher whom he credits with having helping, to help, helping to change him from being a brain-dead liberal. Uh, and Walter Williams, to my knowledge, is the first and I think only uh, economics chairman of a non-historically uh, black college or university. Uh, both Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams collectively have probably written about 60 books. Uh, and most black Americans don't know who they are in part because of the way they are treated by the black media that completely excludes them and acts as if they don't even exist. And it's an absolute outrage. And I address that to some extent in this film. Finally, and most importantly, language is the strongest component of expression, preserving liberty, and preventing conflict. Intention is important. How we perceive language 
and how we use language is key to our country. It is key to our culture. The weaponization of language has been heavy within the last few decades, specifically within the black community, a word that everyone in the world knows because it's been popularized by hip hop and movies in our pop culture. And you know the word I'm talking about. The word nigga has been used for years as a social contextual phrase and though it can still be used in very offensive circumstances, or in certain circumstances it's used in offensive ways, it would be ignorant to ignore the fact that it has also changed into a social contextual phrase as well. It's technically, it's a pronoun. With all these new pronouns popping up left and right, it's hard to ignore that this also is a pronoun, hilarious as it may be. But also, it is being weaponized by these critical race theory postmodernists. Tyler the Creator spoke with Larry King about the obnoxious cultural conflict on the word nigga, and essentially how it is a double standard. You've been criticized for using offensive language in lyrics and songs. It doesn't seem to bother you. Why do you use offensive language? Like I mean, do you, do you use that for effect? In other words, it's effective to say that. Or do you enjoy saying it, or is it natural to you? Yeah, it's just pretty natural. I don't, I don't really think twice on it, I guess. I don't know. It's just words, man. Does the society object to it? Uh, some, like people who live in caves and like are pretty bored. Do you use the N-word? Yes. Now, that's an offensive word to- To some people, to many people. And how, in what terms do you use it? I don't know, man. See, like, people have to understand, I grew up in a different time to so where Explain that word me. is just a word. It has no effect, but it is a double standard because there's certain people who will get offended if someone who doesn't have the skin tone of me says it, like, which is really weird, you know? Like, then they're keeping the original meaning of that um, a lot. I don't know how to explain it. Um, well, if a white person says Yeah, it, like if a white person says it... Isn't it derogatory? Like, it's derogatory because your skin isn't the same color yeah. as mine. But why when I... It's just weird that a lot of people still get, you know... Upset. Upset with that. And it's like, just, I don't know. I think you give certain words power. Like, are you saying it's just a word? Yeah, like, if, if you choose is to be... Is there any thing, word you that... You could call me a an and I would not give a fuck. Is there any word that would bother you? Would the word boy bother you? If someone no, said, hey, boy... Not at all. Wouldn't bother you. Not no all. word would bother you. No. So anybody could call you anything. Yeah, I wouldn't care. I'm going to end this series with another clip from Odd Future featuring Tyler the Creator. You can see the clear difference in perspective that Tyler and Odd Future have on the word nigga with the radio hosts who in the show claim to be from a different generation. And so the word means something different to them. Whereas Tyler and Odd Future have a perspective on why the word only has as much power as you give it because it's been culturally changed. The culture has changed how the word is being used. <laughs> yeah. no, that'd be awesome. That's like not that far fetched. It'll be an improvement. Nigga channel. Oh, Tyler, that's oh, not, oh, how dare I'm you, not, I you shouldn't do that. Wait, hold on, if you call, Fuck. if that's your name for TV One, what's your name for BET? I don't know, I don't watch that shit. No. I hate BET, fuck. What? Whoa. Have you ever said nigga? No. He's lying! No, Why do you, you say that? I'm not lying. Hey, have you ever sang along with a song like, Hey, you, you just, you just know, a been, we talked like about this. So ask, you're seven. ask Sife about my edits, ask Sife about my edits. Yeah, he got the ill edits. My self edits are incredible. What about Clancy? Does Clancy say the N word? No, Clancy's never said it actually. I've never Yo, we're saying. old school. We're, we're, this, is, this is how we grew up. You want to be a part of the black shit? You watch your mouth. We grew up <laughs> little new young bucks. Y'all let the white boys slide. Yeah, because we, we, we my actually, generation, we stomp out. Yeah, y'all stomp out. We don't actually don't give do a shit. fuck about that shit. Y'all don't do shit. Motherfuckers, who cares? The reason why racism is still alive, if you yeah, think you, about you, it. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Oh, you caught feelings just now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes she did. I did. Go in. You gotta understand what they fought for. Like if um, if we if they didn't fight for that, you would not be yo, doing what yeah, you're doing right now. I know. You that's gotta respect sick. the legacy and the heritage. That's sick. Oh, that's sick. But, That's cool. But why do you think it's why do you not give a fuck? Because it's like, like we're not even like I guess people my age we're not even thinking like that. Well, you like, need to start thinking like. But that. when you oh, think like that, backwards. you keep the racism alive no, when that's not don't. even on our palate. What do you stand for? Uh, being rich Skating. and trying to have as much fun Skating, as I can as possible. Skating, smoking, fucking, and rhyming. I go swimming too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he got the sick dives. 
I want to learn that shit, but I'm like too. Well, at least you guys are breaking shit, the though, stereotype nah, with nah, swimming. Nah, real, real shit, real shit. <laughs> I real snowboard shit. too. It only matters when somebody's trying to disrespect. Yeah. What if someone no said trying, trying to disrespect? To disrespect? What if someone said it? What if a white kid said it being disrespectful? Well, I don't know. I'm not in that position right now. But if so, you were, I don't know. You smacking him with the skateboard? It's a, it's a then and there thing. It's never happened plan. before. It's I need never you to happened. plan and practice. Tyler, nigga. I want planning and practice. You I want you to, to rehearse the white boy smackdown. The fucking Ebro, you yes. play the white guy. Ebro, you play the white guy. Fuck you, nigger. Oh, my oh, God. Oh, man. You didn't have to take it there. See, <laughs> 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 that shit hurts right in here. Um, it doesn't. Like, what if he said it? Go for it, Rosenberg. That I laugh. Be kind of funny. Give him a good <laughs> fuck, you nigger. I'm I, I would you know, advise against that. Fucking monkey. You nigger. Let's go now. You fucking monkey. You're making me sound so old. <laughs> you big lip nigger. You fucking like potato salad and fucking nigger shit. You sound like Mel Gibson. <laughs> oh, he's awesome. <laughs> that motherfucker's crazy. <laughs> but thanks, guys. This Dude. interview sucked. Oh, it's <laughs> continuing in a long tradition of sucky yeah. interviews. Nah, we have. Matter of nah, fact, it was, the mo- it was actually kind of an interview. Yeah, we know you actually had a kind of little racial. Stupid. This shit is stupid. We had racial profiling and shit from the lightest <laughs> nigga in the room. <laughs> I think Kay is mad at me, and I don't like it. No. She is. She she's, definitely she's is. She's very old. Now it's awkward. Now every time I look in your direction, I just okay, sense I this. You like black girls. To tighten up. Watch this. What? Do you like black girls? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't believe you. What? He's lying. He's definitely lying. How do you think I'm lying? <laughs> <laughs> so you don't date black girls? Or you just don't have sex Yo, with black girls? Black girls are cool. They're cool. Black I girls like don't mi- like you? I like mixed chicks. Do black girls like you? I like black and white chicks together. They're slowly starting to think I'm cool. At like, first they mean? thought I was weird. You are a little weird. Okay, see, exactly. That's that mind state. No, but y'all weird, have, and weird y'all can be like fun. shit. Weird can but be fun. Like shit. But it's but a little... like shit. Knowledge is power. Share these recordings of history with people you know and people who need to know. Thanks for tuning in. And if you like my work, please consider supporting my series and buying a deck of cards from my store, La Lotaria Loca. <laughs>